hot flash, crew is hot, always doing you right With a fresh take on gaming weekly, PCs, consoles, and handhelds Bump what you heard since birth on this earth, we know that the future belongs to the nerds Revolve alive, what you say? Revolve alive, every Sunday at 6, bringing that gaming magic to your life Doing it live on Twitch to show that you don't want to miss, be sure to subscribe Crack yourself a brew, if it work, are you who now? You can join the crew for the ride Xbox, mobile, and hot topics around the nation To gaming rigs, headsets, hardware, and PlayStation Shout out to Joe, can't you see him glow? Token brother brought the flow, now it's time for the show Let's go! go. Life. what's going on guys welcome to revolver live the gaming podcast this is forget the past the future belongs to the nerds i'm the beastly gamer today i'm joined by my friends co-hosts cohorts and co-conspirators the king of all things destiny briar rabbit how you feeling today buddy i'm feeling awesome man how you doing i'm always Actually, i'm a little good, bit tired man. i'm lying i'm a little tired oh man i've been <laughs> sick all weekend sick as a dog and i'm in here now doing revolver live what's going on wilson how you feeling today my friend Doing good, man. Doing good. I hope you feel better soon. Said you weren't feeling think, good all I weekend. This, I think this is the pill that I, I needed. You know, unfortunately, yeah. I got to take it uh, rectally, but I, I think I'll be okay. How you feeling today, Gary Diaz? <laughs> feeling good, to be fair. They've just released a Gal Gun game on VR, so I've been snapping Japanese schoolgirls' panties. To be fair, my right arm is killing me, but I'm here and I'm ready to go. Wow. Purple tunnel. I'm snapping them panties. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It Revolver was funny, Live but was... also uncomfortable all at the same time. <laughs> I was talking I about clicking the mouse. Was I was clicking the mouse. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you guys are filthy. <laughs> is that what they call it nowadays, Gary? Revolver Live is a gaming podcast with six revolving topics. Become a part of the show by submitting your topics for consideration at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. That's revolvergamescast at gmail.com. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. That's twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. The video is also shared on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's YouTube page and my page, Beastly Gamer. If you can't catch the live feed or the video format, check us out in podcast form on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service provider. And with that said, welcome to Revolver Live Episode 4. Let's go. What's going on, fellas? And I don't know about you guys, but I've been having a pretty good week gaming-wise. Uh, and we'll get into that later. But we also got some feedback from last week's episode. Uh, that I definitely would like to go over, um, Gary. We got we got a few emails that you wanted to talk about, right? We did. We've uh, we've been overwhelmed. It's like you know, never rains but it pours. People have been loving to send us shit. Uh, no nudes. We have waited week upon really? week. Still none. <sighs> um, you guys just keep <laughs> sending us shit about games like it's like really we depressing. care, but you know it's it's here. So let's read it out and uh, again just emphasize the nudes. First one of the week is actually from a guy, um, Clifton Gibbons, uh, signing off Clifton. So thanks for hitting up. He had some comments on the audio um, and, I guess, integration of Apple in the audio. So kind of a blend of two topics. And oh. he runs quite a, um, a detailed setup here that he goes into at length. But the thing that he wanted to talk about is where his Apple integration comes into play. So he uses an Apple TV, an iPad Mini 2, a MacBook Pro and an iPhone 6 Plus has them all connected up and synchronized so to him the apple ecosystem is what sells it it's not necessarily the individual power or capability of each platform so i guess if, are you drinking from that kool-aid too brian it, you know I, i've talked about it in the past it's it's actually it, it's a feature while you're using it but if you like if you want to get away from it it's actually it's troubling because all of a sudden i'm like okay all my addresses are in there all my music's in there all my preferences are in there all my work is in there. Like, like, there's so many ways that it's all integrated together into iCloud or into the Apple ecosystem that to try and then extract yourself out of there can actually be quite difficult. Right now, I'm, I'm working very diligently to learn, um, you know, non-Apple programs for what I do on YouTube, and it's been very, very difficult for me uh, to the point where I'm almost, I'm like rethinking it. Oh wow. Change like that is really hard when you get used to a set way of doing something in a set program. It's 
really hard to make that change. I mean, I use something really basic, uh, Windows Movie Maker, and I even tried to jump on uh, PS4 and use the editing software on that. And it took me like 20 minutes just to figure out how to like chop up a clip. And I'm like, man, I could have been halfway done with my video on Windows Movie yeah, Maker by yeah. now. So it, it's tough, man, making that change. You know, like everything I want to do in Premiere, I have to go onto the internet and say, okay, how do I, how do I, like, how do I lead a lead volume into a clip so it doesn't just start off max volume? It like leads in. It takes me ten minutes to learn that, whereas it's like a literally a three second operation for me in in uh, Final Cut Pro. And and that's not to say that you know they're doing it wrong on Windows. It's just to say that I have to relearn everything. Um, you know, if I want to, even iTunes, you know, if I want all my music to come into iTunes or be on my PC, it's like, well, do I want to run iTunes on my PC? Probably not because that it sucks. It's hard, you know, they, they, it's, they've trapped you for me. Well, when I was using Final Cut, I found it to be extremely easy uh, when I was messing around my brother's iP I mean, his uh, MacBook mm -hmm. and it was incredible. It was fast, intuitive and everything you needed seemed to be right there. Yeah. So I didn't have to do much Googling anything, but Sony Vegas on my PC, it's much more complicated. I've probably over the last four years spent 10 hours, you know, learning different techniques to use. And that learning process can be, you know, stressful, uh, trying to do things in a different way. But once you learn it, Briar, it becomes second nature. It's like now, even though this is to me, it still leaps behind uh, uh, the offerings on uh, Apple products. It's become something that's so useful to me, and I know it so well now. So once you learn it, like if you keep keep working with Premiere, it'll come a point where you won't even have to worry about Apple anymore. You'll just be so used to doing it. You know how to get exactly what you want out of a project. But I, I mean, coming from you know Final Cut to anything else is going to be you know kind of a, a smack in the face with a brick because yeah. Final Cut is so easy to use and it's so fast, and you, it seems like you lose so much by going from Final Cut to going to another editing software. But once you figure it out, it'll become second nature. And you won't, Because I mean, unless, uh, like we said last week, unless Apple does something different with their hardware in the future, there's really no other recourse. You gotta learn this new stuff. Right. So second bit of feedback we've got came from friend of the show, Super Dan, who has yeah. picked up with um, a bit of, I guess, suggestion for a topic, but more of a broad thing for listeners and ourselves. Talking about um, classic vintage games and, and couch co-op, so looking at the SNES and Sega gaming era, and looking at the you know, that toaster that you've got behind you, basically you keep pointing to and triggering us all. Um, looking at the SNES Wait, did you say mini poster console, or toaster, because I'm just drawn to the poster. <laughs> yeah, man. Can we just can we, before we go into this here? Can we just say for people who aren't watching this, for people who are listening. BC's got a fucking full-size picture of himself <laughs> behind himself. What sort of narcissistic arsehole has a picture of himself <laughs> behind themselves? You know who else had a poster of themselves? Did you guys ever see the King of Kong, that Billy Mitchell guy? Yeah. That, that, yeah, that guy had a poster of himself. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to keep it fair, uh, Gary, I also have a life-size replica of my penis in my bedroom. That's why my kids can't go in there. My wife spends so much time in there. You know, just that looking at sense. the, the I mean, art. It's, it's a very small wall behind your bed, so it kind of makes sense to fit. Anatomically you gotta, correct. You got to fit the art to the to the size of the wall, right? Like you don't want to have it. <laughs> it's, it's the canvas. Yeah, my, my ceiling in my bedroom just slants down. <laughs> Tiny wall in the corner over there. It's all good. It's all good. So, Super Dan talks about the the advent of couch co-op and thinks that he'd love to play those games again, but he just doesn't have people that can all congregate around a couch to do it. So. If they, um, I guess, if these games are reintroduced into the current gamers ecosystem, do you think they need an online ecosystem to be popular again? So you can, like, all four of us could get together and play one of those old vintage games online. I think so. I think that would not only make a huge selling point for them, but it would make me want to go back and play a lot of these old games. Like, if we could do uh, Turtles in Time on oh. Super Nintendo... Man. Four player, you know, dibs on Donatello. I'm just Michelangelo saying. all day. All right. Back off, Donatello. But uh, if we could <laughs> all do that online, like that's really cool. Like they released a, uh, it was, oh man, it was a handful of years ago, but it was like Double Dragon Neon, and it was just like a revamped, redid Double Dragon where you could online co op with a friend, and it's awesome. And I totally understand that, like, you know, I have the want to play these games too, but you don't always have somebody to play those games with. And 
SNES 9X, an old popular Super Nintendo emulator, used to have that function on it where you could actually connect to the internet with other people who are wanting to play the same game as you, and that shit got shut down quick. Yeah. So uh, they I also think did they the same a... thing. They did the same thing with uh, Final Fight as well, Wilson. Uh, Double Double Dragon Neon and Final Fight were kind of similar veins of arcade games, uh, and of course they came to the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. Uh, but when they released the newer versions on seven generation consoles, they had this ability. You could still feel like you're doing couch co-op playing with people around the world, and that's really a huge draw, especially for people closer to our age who grew up with couch co-op. You guys know how special that feeling is. It's one. It's something that I, I miss tremendously because all my friends are all gone, and, and we've lost a lot of that connection. A lot of us don't have time anymore, but that couch co-op was something really special, uh, you know, in the, in the 90s and the 2000s for gamers. Yeah. I, I don't know that it it's it's worth, a, worth developing for, though, anymore. You know, I, I don't have a broad swath of sample size, but my kids, they play online. They don't they don't invite their friends over to play video games. It's just not something that happens anymore. You know, the online world has really kind of taken that that couch co op and just made it available to everybody all the time. Except you're not you know you know you can't just reach over and punch your buddy in the shoulder anymore. You know, so I, games do get developed that have couch co op. I just don't know if it's worth it for the developers to do it anymore. You can always DDoS your buddies. That's kind of the equivalent of a punch across the cipher, isn't it? Yeah. Unplug the controller. That's the old school DDoS, man. You just, <laughs> yeah, you just yank right. that thing out, man. Or you give him the shitty controller, too. Remember you don't want to go to a friend's yeah. house and he'd want to play and he'd give you the shitty controller and you're at a clear the disadvantage. Blockbuster branded controller. <laughs> Fucking Mad Cats or whatever the hell it was. Yeah, Get it out of here. Get it out of here. <laughs> but, like, I... As far as like developing for newer games with Couch Co-op, but like if they were to, like say, um, on the Nintendo market where they have these old games or whatever, if they could somehow implement it with the old games, I think that would be massive because there is a huge retro gaming community that is, I mean, probably one of the most passionate communities I've ever seen. These guys go out on their way to work, they see a garage sale, they stop, they pick up old games. Um, and I feel that they meet a lot of friends at conventions. There's a lot of different retro video gaming conventions where these people go around and meet friends. And I think it would be awesome if they had a way to play some of their favorite games. Uh, yeah, that, even if you had like, to purchase it again through Nintendo, you know what I mean? Talking on about the, online, the marketplace. Like the, yeah, yeah. If they could do it online, not necessarily like couch to couch, but if you could somehow get these games linked couch. up online. It, it'd yeah. be a vir <laughs> virtual console add-on type of thing. And, and Nintendo has been very slow to um, address grievances that consumers have had with the way that they've, uh, I guess, focused or approached online infrastructure in their gaming. They were, they were late to the, to the ball. Uh, they were very, very slow when it, come to, it came to innovating their online infrastructure. And uh, most of the games we're talking about here, let's be honest, we're talking about Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis era games. And, and a majority of those are Super Nintendo games. And I just don't see, unless Nintendo were to implement something like this for the virtual console for the Switch, it probably won't happen. But the good thing is, there has been developers who still allow that to happen. This is uh, one of the steel, steel books we talked about last week. Resident Evil 5, this game allowed it. And that was one of the, the best games I, I want to say I played in 2011 and 2012, me and my wife. We sat there side by side and went through it. It's just a special kind of experience when you don't have to get online and you can just play with somebody. I think it's a a great thing, and I'd love to see it come back, but more than likely, if, if we read the tea leaves or look at the, the past as any indication of the future, Nintendo is going to be kind of uh, apprehensive about doing anything like that. Agreed. I think nothing beats playing with someone on a couch. Um, the next bit no, of feedback no comes from Lord Praedith, um, who talks about the grinding games, which is something we spoke around last week, and why do we like the grind, and what is the grind? And he said that he noticed that the grind is slowly evaporating from games. Games just don't have the grind anymore. Um, feels like gamers' tastes just aren't tolerant for that level of grind. Talks about World of Warcraft as an example, so this man's immediately given me a hard-on. Um, talks about how these uh, the dungeons used to be tough, but now they're just cakewalks breeze through, which I completely agree, and he's, he's on the money. You know, Now they feel more of a chore that you're trying to get through rather than a, a tactical, um, I guess, task that you're, you're trying to overcome. Um, he said that... Does game difficulty need to return for games to feel grindy? You know, if a game's really simplistic and easy, do the, does the grind just feel monotonous and something you don't want to do if there's no challenge to it? 
Absolutely. Um, that's an option I think that needs to be in every game. And, and it goes beyond just, you know, making an enemy have, uh, you know, more sponges for bullets. I think AI is a huge part of that. But uh, difficulty is something that I don't think anyone should have, like, a free pass in any video game to just walk through it easily. Unless you go into the options menu and go down to the snowflake section. I think that they're, they're, I think that just, I guess, the regular settings of a game should be moderately difficult. You know, I like a game that gives me a little bit of difficulty rather than just walking through and experiencing it like a film. You know what I mean? And I think every game should have that option. Nowadays, you got to beat a game to unlock like a super hard mode or something like that. I think that should be available from the beginning. For sure. Um, next one's a really quick question from Mr. Jazz Gaming. Um, um, Brian, don't feel in any way obliged from your sponsorships to, to recommend one product over the other. Wants to know what sort of USB microphones in the $100 to $300 range we could recommend as new content creators that are looking to really improve their audio. Um, I think he was moved by our topic on audio last week. He's heard good things about the Blue Yeti and Razer Siren, but would love our advice. Razer Siren is a Blue Yeti with different branding. Um, it's the same It's the same, headphone, it's the same microphone. Um, the Blue Yetis are great. The Snowballs are also great. Uh, the Is it ours? No, Audio Technica, uh, I think is a step up from there. Uh, that those are very good as well. Uh, if you can get into the three hundred dollar range, you can start getting into XLR mi microphones uh, that can sound really good and offer a lot of customization as well. So you're not just kind of stuck with how this microphone sounds because all this circuitry is exactly the same. Uh, you can really start customizing it and stuff. So once you start spending around three hundred dollars, you start getting. Uh, more options but you can also use software to customize your sound um either if it's recorded you can you can modify the sound after the recording or you can even with something like adobe audition you can you can alter you can give yourself like a radio voice live so it's actually processing the sound live audacity is really awesome for post-processing like if you want to record something and, and you want to yeah it's really good it is so very I'm going to hold a revolver to your head and force you like a politician to answer the man's question, goddammit. He wants a recommendation. He doesn't well, want a buffet. <laughs> Give him one. You want a, you want a recommendation, but he gave me too wide a price range to work within. If if he's going to spend $100, I would absolutely recommend the, uh, the Blue Yeti. If he's going to spend $300, uh, I really look at uh, what I got. I, I went with the Shure SM7B, and I really like that microphone. Or, uh, God, what's it called? Uh, there's another one that's really popular. I think it's more, though. I think it's $500, so never mind. Okay, so there you have it. Shure SM7B or Blue Yeti, if you're flossing or if you're on a pauper's budget. I like it. Um, there's one more, but I'm going to save that till the end of the show because I think it's something that's good to close with. So it's a, a little sneaky one at the end. He introduced <laughs> us as Revolverados, which sold me immediately. But uh, Oh, that's sick. <laughs> nice. Well, I got some feedback over here from Discord, so hopping into that from Grays81 says, As far as Apple products, I have a hard time, especially in Canada, justifying the price for their products when I can get a machine in PC terms that is more powerful than cheaper. So definitely agrees. That was kind of the point that we had driven home last week, that, you know, obviously for gaming you want a PC, not a Mac. So Yeah, I mean, there's, um, no, there's no justified <laughs> buying a Mac for gaming. Uh, not yeah. right now, anyway. My my guess is that actually Apple wants to make a push into gaming soon. Um, the way things are like kind of leading in, Nvidia released drivers for uh, Mac OS. Uh, the new Macs that are coming out, I think in December, actually have like real graphics cards in them. Um, you know, they got a new Mac Pro coming out next year. My guess is that actually, the, there's nothing about the Mac OS that means it can't run so games. It's just that. You know the the driver optimization isn't there. The the graphics cards aren't there. So like, you know, they could be they could do something about that. But uh, hardware is definitely more expensive. But it also is runs Mac OS <laughs> and Final Cut Pro. And you know, like it, it, you know, there's there's a trade off there. I, often it's not that much more expensive either. That's kind of the point that Grays had also made. He said, uh, I've also found iOS to be very restrictive in usage and openness. When I bought an iPad, I didn't feel like I could personalize it the way I could an Android, an Android device, which I think, Briar, you had made that point, that it wasn't Android devices were more 
you know, easier to uh, personalize versus an Apple product. <clears throat> Mr. Goodbites says, um, loved being it open, but aside from that, it was a horrible experience with um, Android. So that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. And then Dirty Socks Music says, first off, keep up the great work, guys. We appreciate that. On the subject of collector's editions, I have to have anything collectors or tangible items of the games that I love or I'm hyped about. Uh, he also then goes on to state that he's never been an Apple fan and has always had Windows, PC, and Android. Android and he feels like he feels like Gary makes a lot of sense about Apple, but it could just be his voice that makes me think makes him think that he makes good points. <laughs> it is. It is the yeah, voice. Absolutely, it is. Oh, absolutely. You're if you actually, dirty if socks. you write down what Gary says, you'll find Bullshit. out that. It, it's all bullshit. <laughs> if you read it back with your own thought or have someone like one of your friends read it, you just realize it's full of shit. Is this guy high? Like, I swear to God, he's <laughs> drunk all the time. <laughs> well, we still love him, nonetheless. No comment. And that's that's going to do it for uh, Discord feedback. So, Thank you guys for sending the feedback. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we do appreciate it. <laughs> Talking about being high all the time. Hellblade, man. That was oh a my fucking God. trip. That <laughs> was did you, did trip. you beat that game, Gary, already? Hellblade is... We'll, we'll get into what there is. Briar's beaten it. I'm very close to. But Hellblade is like if Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn ate some bad shrooms when she was foraging and ended up in some fucking trip. My God, the game is is something else. What did you think, bro? There's a few games that I've played in my life that I felt were perspective shifts. Like they they changed the way I look at games, and they they changed the way I even look at like normal life. And this is one of those things. It's one of those games that I walked away saying like, I have a newfound respect for uh, you know people with these these challenges in life. You know, like it's living. So the, the game, let me just set up the game a little bit, is you play as Senua. Uh, she's a Celtic uh, warrior who has lost everything, and she's going, she, she's literally going to try and re get a god to uh, res her, her lover, right? To bring her lover back to life. And she's, she's gone off the deep end, right? She's, she's hearing voices, she's seeing things that aren't there. Like, it's just, like, she's, Falling down this road of, you know, mental illness. So the game to simulate this is it puts you in her shoes in a lot of ways. You you hear these voices in your head and they're telling you conflicting things. Like if you're walking down a bridge, you know, the, the voices are saying, turn back, turn back, you're going to die, turn back, turn back. And a lot of times there's three, four voices all doing this at the same time. And they're constant. They're going pretty much the entire game. Um, you know, visual things in the game will will start to change based on how close you are to danger and how, you know, like in what kind of uh, stressful situation Senna was in. You know, the girl, the game is like a third person action adventure game, like on the surface. And for what it is, it's fine. I'd put it on the level of like, I don't know, like a short version of like a Uncharted game, I guess. You know, it's not what I mean by that is I come to Uncharted for the story, not necessarily for the action or the or the um, any gameplay. of the gameplay. Yeah. So the, this game has gameplay. There's sword fighting and it's it's OK. Sword fighting. It's fun. It's not you know, it's not super deep. It's not super in depth, um, but it's fun. There's puzzles. They're not super deep puzzles, but they're kind of fun. They play with the environment a little bit in some cool ways. Um, but what really sells this game is. Kind of learning about this girl's mental illness and then feeling like you have a better understanding of mental illness when you're actually done with the game, which I think is amazing. I can't think wow. of another game that's done that, that has taken a play on mental illness in, how do I say it, like not done it in a mocking fashion, you know what I mean? Like it actually made it a part of the story and made you feel for this serious. person and like, yeah. and like, yeah, it took it, it was considerate about the whole thing, like for the most part, like. I haven't got to play it. I only saw what Briar stream. I'm like, Gary, how'd you put it, Gary? She got a hold of some bad shrooms. There are no bad shrooms. There's either too much shrooms or not enough. <laughs> like, so it was, 
It was super intense. It was very trippy. And I got to say, um, as far as gameplay went, it had almost, from what I saw, like a um, bit of a Dark Souls combat style to it a little bit. Like there was a lot of, I noticed you really had to depend really? on your dodge. Yeah. Like, you really had to depend on enemies telegraphing It's not nearly as difficult as something like Dark Souls, though. So. Right. No, yeah. I'm just saying as like as way the combat kind of works, not difficulty wise, but just the mechanics. Like you had to read your enemies and like they would be telegraphing that they were going to be doing like an overhead swing and stuff like that. And the combat looked really smooth. I, I got a quick question. Uh, the question I've had about this game, because it's, it's been in development for a few years and I'm happy it's out. It's not a full price game. I saw that. Yeah. Is this game in any way tied to the old PlayStation game, Heavenly Sword? No, just same developers. Right. It seemed like, I, I mean, I played Heavenly Sword, thought it was amazing. It seemed like it's in the same world. Ah, yeah. okay. No, it's Unlikely. A, no, it's a unique title. I can see that, you know, it's a female protagonist. Um, other than that, I guess I actually can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you looked around with it. <laughs> okay. Well, would you recommend uh, me pick? Now, I told you guys pre-show that the uh, man, the myth, Joe, my brother, uh, sent me a, a text today and told me this game is one I need to pick up. Yeah. Would you recommend this game, Brian? For thirty dollars, I mean, it's not the longest game in the world. I think I finished it in the somewhere between six and eight hours. Um, but I was streaming, so you know, there's like extra time in there. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's going to take around six hours to beat. And for thirty dollars, that's not a lot of time. But it's a it's a game that I'm going to look back on in the same vein as I look back on in Bioshock and say, I wish I could go back and play that for the first time again. Wow. Wow. Okay. So this did everything right that the Order 1886 didn't do. Gotcha. I don't, what's that? I don't get the comparison to Order 1886. The Order 1886 was a, a full price game that lasted six hours and it was shitty all around other than the fact that the game looked amazing. Oh. Yeah, this game looks amazing too. Okay. <laughs> Gary, yeah, you I mean, had a chance to jump in and play it, didn't you? I did, yeah. There's, there's actually, from a gameplay perspective wise, I really liked it. It kind of played to me more like a puzzle game more than an action game. Um, and I see where you're going with Uncharted, but to me, it felt more like a Professor Layton or a Broken Sword kind of game. So if you're into really? that style game, but, but I, I was put off immediately by the horror aspect of it. I don't like horror games, and I found it very unsettling. Um, certainly some of the earlier trials, some of the earlier enemies that you face are a little bit more um, terrifying. The game then, the, the pace slows and then it builds up to some slightly more horrifying parts towards the, the tail end of the game. So there is a very strong horror vibe to it, which will be off-putting to some people. But the puzzle elements, if you do like puzzle games, um, they're very strong in it. Somewhat repetitive, but the, the, the way, as Brian said, the way that the levels are, the level itself is the puzzle. Uh, and the way that you approach and view the level is is the puzzle and the challenges of viewing it from an unstable state of mind um, as, uh, can add to it. There's actually, I've, I've read up a, a bit around it because some of the early elements of the game, you'll look at a level and you'll think there's absolutely no way to go. This is a dead end. I can't move in it. You'll walk away, come back and the way will be clear ahead. And you won't have activated anything. This isn't a clever thing that you've got to do a switch or anything else. The developers put in a couple of roadblocks that when you revisit will be gone. And it's to kind of trick your mind into thinking, what's that there? Is that something that's that's gone? Is it something that's my mind gone? Or is the character's mind gone? Where's where's it going? And yeah, some some aspects of, of, of the game that I found that were, that were really, really unsettling uh, and also really compelling. If I transi transition up from what the game is to what the game represents it's part of a genre that that ninja theory are trying to rekindle which is the double a genre which has kind of gone from gaming in our modern era so you've got indies and you've got triple a's yeah and there's a gulf between them you know the indie is typically things like stardew valley or hollow knight or you know a 2d side scroller or something that's very very low budget um sometimes a hit but not got a lot of investment in it. And then your AAA is the things like Assassin's Creed and COD, which are annual franchises, huge amounts of money behind them. They'll sell no matter what. They've got the graphics. They've got the look. So what Ninja Theory were trying to do was create something that had the presentation quality and the, the chops of a AAA game, but with the independent studio creativity and maybe not the length of and the, the depth of content, as, as Brian was saying, that you get in a AAA title, but also not carrying the same price tag, which is something you've seen with Lawbreakers as well this week. So what do you guys think about it representing the, the resurgence of the, the AA game? 
to me, it's really exciting. And, you know, it, it fills in that gap that a lot of people have been longing for. You know, no one wants a game that doesn't feel like a complete package, a complete experience at a full price. So I think that especially with this game and Lawbreakers coming out within the last seven days, one at $30 and one at $40. I mean, this is a huge deal for me. I mean, games like Friday the 13th also did this. So it appears to be something that's becoming more prevalent. And I, for one, am really excited about the prospect of seeing more games in this vein. Even though this game, when I see it, it looks like a AAA experience. The fact that it's a it little bit shorter. It feels like one, Beastly. It feels yeah, like it, one. It's a, the, the fact that it's a shorter experience, I think, is what, what Gary is referring to as the double-A experience. It's not as long, and, and I guess the, the replay value isn't quite as strong as some of the other offerings out there. Does it have a, a multiplayer mode or online mode at all? No. Okay, so that's Comes that's with exactly a documentary what it is. about the making of it. Oh, yeah. sweet. Well, I look at it this way. I mean, you said, what, it's six to eight hours for 30 bucks. I mean, dude, I could easily drop more than 30 bucks going to the movie theaters for oh, yeah. two hours. You know That's what I mean? Enough. And being a fan, being family men, I'm sure you guys are like 30 bucks. Man, I wish I could only spend that much going to the movie theater. You yeah. know, like you guys are probably 30 yeah. bucks in by the time you got your tickets and yeah. before you even get snacks and stuff. So uh, I think the double A games. Um, can fill a void that's there. I mean, I don't know if I'd necessarily call like PUBG a double A game, but it's kind of in like Lawbreakers in a sense that it's cheap and like you can pretty much only do multiplayer and there is a lot of replayability there. But I feel like this is kind of like the different end of the spectrum of AAA games where like the single player aspect of not as much replayability. I still think it's really worth it though, in my opinion. Like I these kind of games are perfect for the the video game lull that I'm in right now. We're all waiting yes. for Destiny 2. <laughs> and I feel like these games fit those, fill that void perfectly. And if they can, re if they could take a look at what's coming out and what people are waiting for and fit these games in in between, I think they'll sell really well. Yeah. I mean, this game, if they charge $60 for it, it it's, it'd be harder for me if to, to have bought it initially, but having played it, I'd say $60, no problem. Like it, it, it wow, blew really? my mind. This game blew my mind, man. It, it was literally, I will never look at, you know, mental illness the same way again for the rest of my life having, you know, played this game. It changed the way I look at mental illness. My God, it changed right? the way um, I, I interact with human beings. That is a hell of a statement, man. Uh, That's I powerful. Have to, I'm going to buy this game as soon as we get done with Revolver tonight. That is something else. I've never heard. PC Shut up, Gary. Or PS4. I'm just asking. Listen, okay. I'm, 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 Let me I'm explain genuinely something concerned to you. about you. You don't I'm, need to be concerned. I'm surrounded by all my consoles and I feel right at fucking home. I'm buying it on the PlayStation 4. I'm buying <laughs> right. on PS4 Pro. There's because issues. I'm not good with, with the mouse and keyboard. The base console has significant issues with frame rate um, at the moment and frame pacing, as PS4 well as Pro. resolution scaling. Yeah. The PS4 Pro, unfortunately, has even worse issues in that they've not capped the frame rate at 30. Uh, so, unfortunately, its its frame rate varies between twenty five and fifty, um, up and down, is which it causes 4K? massive. Or is just it stop it, Gary. No, just stop um, it. It's dynamic scaling, which drops as low as nine hundred p and as high as thirteen hundred p. So it, it scales from nine hundred to thirteen hundred. But sounds, the frame like pacing. Let me explain to you what Gary is. Gary is that guy who knew your wife before she married you. And every time you kiss her, <laughs> tells he tells you, you about the shit she used to do with the other guys. <laughs> Leave my fucking wife alone. I fucking love her, okay? <laughs> and there's lots of people in these comment sections that love their fucking wives. Leave them alone. And she used to love dressing up. That's all I'm saying. Ouch. <laughs> Needs more teraflops, man. man. We need these teraflops. <laughs> I'm concerned. Frame frame pacing is a real problem. It looks like you're playing a slideshow. I was just I, I've heard big problems with well, it. Well, with all these frame rates and stuff, and that like we've been complaining about recently. Do you think it's a good time to build a gaming PC and take the upper, take the next step? Man, is it's a tough a tough time transition? to be pulling that trig, isn't it? Trigger, isn't it? I mean, Intel. What's the date of the uh, eclipse this month? Is it the 19th? The solar eclipse? Oh, 21st. Uh, 21st. 21st. Mm -hmm. So Intel is going to announce their successor to the 7700K, their i7, their, 
the best the get best gaming processor you can get right now for just pure top of the line gaming performance is the Intel i7 7700K. Costs about three hundred fifty dollars, maybe three hundred thirty dollars, and Intel is going to replace replace it or announce the next generation, the Coffee Lake uh, generation of CPUs this month. So it's kind of a rough time to be spending top dollar on a 7700K yeah. when like the next ones are coming out like very very soon. That doesn't mean they're going to they're going to release this month, but they're announcing them this month and it's going to be a 6 core processor instead of a 4 core, which is interesting because if they can maintain their instructions per clock and their their core speed, that's going to be a very good processor. Also, AMD is releasing their new Vega graphics cards which seem to have the power of uh, NVIDIA 1080, but are going to be cheaper. A NVIDIA has brand new graphics cards like out with the, their new Volta architect architecture that are like right on the horizon. Uh, we had uh, uh, the editor-in-chief from PC Gamer on the podcast or on DCP uh, last month, and he tweeted us to say, those are coming out this, this year. So that's like a whole another architecture jump. So that's like going from like the 900 series to the 10 series, right? So it's it's a it's an interesting time because if you jump in right now, chances are in a behind. month or two you're going to be like, "Damn, if I had waited a month, like I'd have this new hot shit." Yeah. And then so, your resale I mean, value is going I, to plummet as I well. I told Gary that um in a private uh, uh message I, you know how we talk on uh, Twitter. We were just talking privately, and I mentioned to him that I plan on doing my PC upgrade around the beginning of the year. And I'm thinking now with this information uh, revealed by the Briar Rabbit himself, that's probably the best time to do it. Because I want to be sure. up to date. I don't want to be left behind anymore. You know, I mean, I, I've, it's I've got good friends. Yeah. PC, the, the issue that we've got here, and we should make clear this is our second topic um, for the week, which is is it a good time to build a gaming PC? The thing about gaming PCs, you are always going to be within six to nine months a generation behind, or at least a flagship product behind what is current top of the line. That's just the nature of the beast. What you have to do is look at your requirements, look at your hardware, and make a decision, is my hardware suitable for the requirement that I need it for? So we're talking about six core i7s. We're talking about the new generation of GPU. The games aren't going to change. You're not going to see. It's not like consoles where when you've got a PS3 to PS4, suddenly the game fidelity jumps up. No, the games will be a consistent slow curve. You know, there's not a hockey stick effect. Gotcha. You'll be playing Destiny 2 in October on PCs. If there's a new i7 that can do it, if there's an i8, whatever, that can do it, it, it it's not going to make any difference. It's the same game. If you've got 144 frames at the resolution you want, it's irrelevant what hardware you're on. So it's not irrelevant yeah. though, because the the relevancy is that for the same cost of hardware, you could possibly get be getting a significant jump in either frames or resolution, or even sometimes in the settings themselves. You instead of playing at uh, high settings, you could be playing at ultra, or instead of playing you know medium settings at 1440, you could be playing ultra settings at 1440, or be playing at you know 144 hertz instead of or 144 frames per second instead of 100, based on the same amount of money spent. But the cost is months of just not playing. Yeah, Gary's I mean, right. There I, always is going to be something on the on the edge. It just seems like there's a lot of really cool stuff on the edge right now. I mean, I had a pretty interesting analogy here that I this is how I justify my PC spend myself. Um. And with the graphics cards, I like to update my graphics card every 12 months as an absolute maximum. So I'll sit with a graphics card for 12 months. The way I see it is you're renting a graphics card. So if you're comfortable to trade in your cards, you've got an initial deposit, which is your buy-in on your first ever card. So let's take the 1080 Ti as your card. If you bought that release, that was what, $750, I think, mm -hmm. American? So $750 was your deposit. You can sell that when the 11 series or 20 series comes out and you'll probably get $500 for it maybe. I'd, I'd imagine someone would probably give you $450, $500. So your rental cost of playing with that card for the year was $250. That was what that card cost you for the year because $250 is going to be the top up that you're going to need to spend 
to get the next card that comes out because you're going to take your 500 that you sold, your next 250, and you're going to buy whatever the 20 series is for $750. So you only really pay once unless you intend to hold on to that hardware because this hardware doesn't drop off the side of a cliff. You know, when the new one comes out, you're probably still going to get 75% of what you paid for it back. And that 1080 mm. Ti, you, there's no one forcing you to sell it after a year. You could you could game on it successfully for many years. Yeah. You know, that 1080 Ti is a damn powerful card, and it's not going to be obsoleted. You're still going to be playing games on high settings two to three years from now on it. You know, you might start in two to three years. That's when you'll start saying, okay, maybe it's time to upgrade, but maybe not. You know? I don't know. It's interesting that there's just so much new stuff coming out, but, you know, like I'm, I'm, I got a new PC on its way right now. I'm upgrading the PC I got right now. Like I've, I literally put a new water cooler in the PC I got because the games I want to play are out right now on PC and I want to be playing them. Um, so if it was me, uh, I'd probably, you know, the other thing is if you're buying a low end PC right now, it's really hard because the cryptocurrency thing is still happening and the low end graphics cards are just skyrocketing in prices. You're paying you're paying five hundred dollars for a card that should cost two hundred fifty dollars, you know, and that's a real bummer. But I mean, if you're a huge Destiny fan, I'd probably wait until right before it comes out for PC to buy to just see what's if the landscape has changed. But man, there's so many games out for PC too that you'll be happy with what you have. I'm sure. I agree. I think I'd hold off, man. Uh, by the time this new stuff comes out, <clears throat> like Gary said, people that only like to invest in their stuff for about a year will have some pretty good deals on their old equipment. I mean, that's pretty much what I did with uh, my buddy. Uh, he And I say his old computer, it was less than a year old. He was ready for the new thing. And some people just like to be on that cutting edge. But Gary, I think you nailed it, dude. It's like um, you throw down a deposit the first time. And like you said, it was like 250 bucks for an entire year. You know, it's less than a dollar a day if you're going to be at your computer a lot. And I think you nailed it with that analogy, dude, to be honest. like <laughs> That's how I justify it. It's a rental cost, you know, because yeah. that, that 250 that I've spent out is my enjoyment opportunity cost. You know, that is I could have spent that somewhere else, but I've spent that having the best graphics card on the market over the year. And that's that's all the money that I've lost. So I'm going to have to drop that extra 250 to top up my deposit or my residual, whatever I make from the sale of the card. And then I'll always have the best card on the market. It's just it's painful the first time you do it. I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, it ain't Absolutely. cheap. Graphic, top end graphics cards are not cheap. Yeah. It helps to sell your old one a lot. Like, definitely helps take the sting away from how much you're, you're paying for one. So. Yeah. Buying used is not a bad way to go either. Yeah. It's really not. You get a significant discount that way. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the used market is like actually in the States, but in the UK. We have such a good secondhand um, electronics infrastructure and not just talking Craigslist here. We've got the equivalent, um, something called Gumtree, which is like, you know, peer to peer, very much like Craigslist, but a lot less kind of likely to be stabbed and robbed. Uh, it's more of an, you know, legitimate well, plus. Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> we've, more. Also got, we've got um, like, I, I keep plugging the store, so I'm going to plug them again. Um, it's it's spelt C-E-X, but pronounced sex. Um, it's a computer exchange is kind of what they've gone with. But you can take like any hardware, games, audio, any sort of equipment you've got, cameras, I mean, pretty much anything. And these guys will give you um, like a trading price, a cash price, or like a pawnbroker, but like a legitimized one. But these have got like nationwide stores. They give you a two-year guarantee on anything that you buy. So if you buy old shit and it breaks, you just pedal it back in there. And these guys will, will be, you know, 25% less than the store on every single product. And you can huh. trade your old shit in to get in-store credit against it. So nine times out of ten, you get stuff for, for almost nothing. You know, there's like a negligible cost to upgrading your gear. So in the UK, definitely, or Europe, because they're, they're bigger than the UK, our second-hand hardware market is, like, vibrant for anything in that space. I don't know if you guys have something like that in the States. No, it's really Craigslist and eBay. Bond yeah, shot or stabbed, pick one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shot. I'll, I'll take it's shot. like the Wild West on Craigslist, man. You're ducking bullets and. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, 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 I'll chat. Somebody hit me is, in the is... head with a fidget spinner the other day. It was fucking awful. No, it's <laughs> hurt. 
See, our chat is also uh, proponents of it. Yeah, CEX or SEX, they're, they're a great uh, thing. I mean, the, the fact you guys don't have it over there is a real real shame because that, you know, if you just say I want a 1080 Ti um, and I happen to have, I don't know, a 980 Ti sitting around, I can take that in. They'll give me like 300 pounds, which is like, I don't know, four, you know $370 towards the cost of the new card. And they might have the card there for $600 rather than 750 So I get a two-year warranty on a card I pay three hundred dollars for it. It's great, and it's a legitimate transaction with a store. It's not some sweaty guy with like yeah, we don't man have seed all over it in uh, in Craigslist. You know? <laughs> we, yeah, how, I wish how we is had that return like policy that. though? How is that warranty? Have you had to cash in on a warranty yet for something? I have. Yeah, I, I bought a hard drive. I bought a three terabyte hard drive for fifty dollars equivalent, maybe. Put it in. The thing just click, 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 click. When it went in, took it straight back in the store. They swapped it for another hard drive or they gave me the money back if they didn't have it in stock. Very, you know, I feel like I'm sponsoring them here and I'm, I feel terrible telling you because you guys don't have that infrastructure over there. But yeah, in, in Europe, we're, we're sorted for it. You know, it's, it's great. It's called sex. Sex. Yeah. We have sex we have, here. Well, I, I agree with bad I, Sex is I'm just great. married, so I don't ever get any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, what's okay. the next topic? Esports. Esports. Is it a real sport or is it just a way of legitimizing being professionally lazy? What do we think? Uh, well, to me, if you can call NASCAR a real sport, then esports can be a real sport. You know, NASCAR I just saw it. Goddamn white man's sport. It's a fucking sport, okay? And you need so, to I sit mean, on a yeah. trailer with a, a lawn chair and just wait for people to crash and die. That's the sport. All you do is it's turn not left. So much man. About the drivers. Turn left. It's considered baby. a sport, and uh, I think that you know, esports is something similar. People, all sports are just entertainment. You know, people want to see it. People enjoy seeing the competition, and I think esports is. I mean, look how much the world has changed in the last thirty years. We all enjoy gaming. We enjoy seeing people be competitive at games, and, and I think that you know it's a very entertaining thing for people to watch. And so, I think a majority of people in the world now will consider esports or electronic ga electronic gaming a sport in its own right. I would much rather watch a person play Destiny than watch NASCAR, and that's a sport. I mean, that's just me being real, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you and NASCAR, man. We've lost, I'm, just, like, all of I'm using NASCAR another cameras. example of, of what is considered a sport, just a guy sitting in a car turning left for a few hours. That's a fucking sport. So if that's a sport, I think video games can be a sport as well. And I it's more enjoyable like to watch. art, though. It's in the eye of the beholder. Like, what is your definition of a sport? Does your if your definition of a sport requires like physical activity, then of course some of this stuff isn't going to appeal to you. But if you're like beastly in sports or entertainment, you know what I mean. Obviously, anything can be a sport at that point. So like, I probably well, should have saved that point for last. But I think it's more of a eye of the beholder thing, man. Well, like, if you think totally about it like that, Wilson, the sports that people aren't entertained by are not are the ones that no one talks about. Unfortunately, there isn't a fucking tetherball league. It should be. But nobody cares about tetherball. So it's not something that people talk about or watch. But other sports, football, basketball, baseball, hockey, people are they enjoy watching it and partaking in seeing it, and it's a huge thing. Yeah. A lot and of it is, thing. right, it's like if I have experience, if I grew up playing football, I'll probably watch a lot more football mm -hmm. on TV because I, you know, I have a strong connection to the game. If I grew up playing uh, Call of Duty, then I'm going to watch some Call of Duty because I have a strong appreciation for the high level that these guys are playing it at, right? It's like mm -hmm. some of it is just like what you're interested in, what you know, and like what you can appreciate. When, can you appreciate the skill on display? Like if you've never played golf and you watch golf on TV, your first comment is going to be like, why are these guys in the funny pants just chasing that ball around this open field? <laughs> so if you've tried to play golf, you get a whole different understanding mm -hmm. of what, what you're watching. Same with baseball. Baseball is – Arguably not that athletic, especially mm -hmm. like 30 years ago before, you know, the roids got involved. I mean, these guys had beer guts. You know, you, know, you look at old baseball cards. They literally had beer guts. You, you hear Bowling. stories. Babe Ruth, man. Yeah. So, like, but baseball, if you've played baseball and you understand how hard it is to actually hit that ball, and then you understand that the at the high level of the – of the mental game that the pitcher and the batter are playing at any point in time, then you can watch a baseball game that, you know, is, has no score to it and be absolutely enthralled. 
because it's you just see this like constant battle of the pitcher and the batter. So it doesn't have to be like this high athletic venture. It has to be, does this interest me? Is this, do I see the high level of play that's being displayed here? And can I appreciate that? I guess you kind of lost me at baseball there. Um, from my, <laughs> <laughs> just like, the hell is this? Is that a sport? It always gets me that baseball, you guys have like world champions. Like, is, yeah. is it really a world champion or is it a domestic champion? Like who else plays baseball? Anyone? Uh, it's world. worldwide because nobody's stepped up it, to take it yet. Yeah, the world yeah. is invited to come and play. Yeah, yeah we're playing <laughs> baseball in our backyard. You guys yeah. could come over and compete. Nobody does, so we win by default. Right. Do yeah. Invited. Best, Japanese, but... Japanese guys, they've been, like, dodging us for years now. The yeah. Cubans know. Um, the Cubans are coming over. <laughs> the Dominicans are coming over. Baseball too, man. <laughs> from what I under understand about spectator numbers in baseball at the moment, the Americans aren't even showing up. So, I mean, <laughs> from from an esports perspective, though, do you think it's just because there's not an organized league? And that's something that I wanted to touch on. So, you mentioned no experience and and perspective being a thing. Like I, I've watched curling in the fucking Winter Olympics, which is some guy yeah. sweeping um, awesome. a weight. Like, I have no, I've never played curling. I've never yeah. seen anyone play curling, but I watched it. Rhythmic gymnastics, right? Where there's a chick throwing a baton in the air and catching it. Again, no perspective. I watched it. Maybe more for the outfits, actually, than the sport, but yeah. still, I watched it. <laughs> you know, all of these things, um, there's a legacy and there's an infrastructure and there's, you know, equ equ fucking equestrian sports where they dance a horse around an arena. Like, I've watched that yeah. for like an hour when it's on. But you must have been stoned as shit. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I live a very boring life, okay? That to me is entertaining. Weed makes everything interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in esports, you've got things like MLG, LOL esports, ESL, game battles. All of these yeah. different leagues are trying to compete. And you've got teams like SK Gaming and, you know, fucking Prodigy and whatever else they're called. And... Um, uh, Dignitas and all of these teams, um, they've got a revolving cast of of. That's pros, one of the right, things right. that sucks the most, I think. Yeah, and there's there's no, um, you know, I can't say I'm collecting esports baseball cards. Let's call it that. Then there's there's no there's no infrastructure. There's nothing to watch on TV. There's nothing to support. And there's so many different leagues that one world champion might only be the world champion in such a small jurisdiction. There's like there's seven world champions for League of Legends. You know, which one's the real world champion? Do you think we need to have ESPN come in and say, we're going to take over esports for it to become a, a legitimate thing? I, I think at some point it does have to, like, it does have to grow. But the nice thing about having all the different the competing leagues is that if if one league isn't given the players and the teams a square deal, then you just leave that league, right? And there's six other leagues that will pit, spit you up. The problem that you run into is if you have like one dominant market, um, let's say it becomes MLG, and that's like the only place that you can you can play competitive gaming, and they say, okay, we're gonna you know we're gonna set up contracts this way. If you're gonna play in MLG, you know you have to you have to abide by all these rules. You can't curse on, you can't curse in public. You you've got to wear you know these outfits. You got to wear a suit when you're in public. Uh, you can no longer live stream. You can no longer make YouTube videos. You know, you, like what? What do you do? You, you're you're trapped because yeah. MLG owns the whole business. So, you know, but this like, is the only sport that that does that. So, if I want to be a professional soccer player, I, yeah. you know, I'm I'm subscribed to FIFA. If I want to follow, um, you know, I want to play basketball. It's the NBA, NFL right. for football. You know, that's, that, that is, exists in every other sport except gaming. So why should gaming be exempt? Because, because it's so new. Yeah, it just hasn't, it hasn't developed to that point yet. People but are still trying to wrap their mind around it that you can be successful with doing it when our entire life growing up, we've been told if you keep playing video games, you're going to fuck your life up. FIFA, you the NFL, I mean? MLB, you know, these are old organizations, right, that have been all around for a long time, and they control their players to the point where a lot of those players are very unhappy. I'm sure if you're, like, the top of the top, cream of the cream you're swimming in money and swimming in you know the adoration of whatever league you're playing in but if you're if you're one of those guys grinding it out i'm sure you got some significant complaints about the way you're treated i know that's true with the mlb and the nba um i don't know really anything about fifa i mean they don't even call it soccer like it should be so uh really hard to even take it seriously 
<laughs> well, you've got the, the LA Galaxy, haven't you? You guys try at least. I mean, I know you struggle, but Never you're having a go, and that's the most important thing. Is that a soccer team? I think so. David Beckham played there a while, didn't he? LA Who's Galaxy. David Beckham. Is that a thing? Oh, like Ben and like Beckham, that girl that was in that movie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the girl that was in that movie. Exactly. I, mean, that, I don't know. I just feel like there needs to be a bit more um, rigidity around what the sport actually is. You know, I mean, look at wrestling. Wrestling's not a regulated sport. I'm talking about, you know, it's not a sport. <laughs> entertainment wrestling. But yeah, but you've got like what the WWE and then yeah. you've got like the WCW and then TNT and all these other fucking wrestling leagues. Who's watching them? No one. Like no one cares. But the WWE has got like a huge fan base. So do you think you need one of these to rise from the crop and, you know, set themselves up? It'd probably up be a good thing, right? Watch? I would like to see some rules about like uh, what teams can do and like how fast like players can just be dropped and traded because like you mentioned before, earlier is you have this problem where like you follow in a team and all of a sudden you watch the next tournament and like three out of the four guys are completely different people. You're like, what the fuck happened? Like this isn't the team I was watching. This isn't the team I was rooting for last time. And it's a little, you know, I, I think that's a problem for the, for keeping the fans active. You know, it's like, you want to be able to sell jerseys. You want to be able to, you know, get you want to be able to build fan a fan base, and you can't do that if you're constantly swapping out your your players. You know, like if you went to a Yankee game and the whole team was just completely fucking different every time you went. Yeah. Like, <laughs> where's the connection? Yeah, where's the connection connect. to the yeah. team? You know, your favorite player. You know what I mean? I'd also kind of like to see, and like some people might not agree with this. I'd like to see some sort of a like if um, a company was to step up and be like, this is the premier. Major league gaming, you know, what I mean, I'd like to see some sort of a code of conduct as well, man, because some of these people, the no. way they pr promote themselves on Twitter <laughs> and the way that they act and stuff like that. Like, I mean, you're very fortunate to be in the position that you're in. And yeah, but, they, but they don't act very. I mean, you don't want to see Michael Jordan on Twitter talking shit to everyone, you know, every time somebody has an opinion. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like if you're going to be a professional athlete, you should act like one. I think that's not... the beauty of it, though, Wilson, is that. The professionals do act like professionals. It's so easy to it's so easy to figure out who's an actual like who's got a fucking head on his shoulders as opposed to who's just fucking gonna pop off at the first sign of like action. You I mean, know? they do. Like, Dennis Rodman, you know, he, he was a wild card back then. Yeah. He was one of my favorite basketball players to watch back then. You didn't know what the hell that guy was gonna do. Conor yeah, McGregor, it was entertaining. Conor McGregor is the biggest fighter in UFC history, right? Huge, a phenomenal guy. Uh, starting his own fighting organization now, fighting. Floyd Mayweather, people fucking love Conor McGregor, and it's because he says what's on his mind. It's not because he's regulated his speech. And I feel like if you regulate people in their private lives, what they say on Twitter or what they say online, it, it stunts people from being themselves. And um, I'm not saying I, you I, can't be yourself. I'm just saying there's definitely some things that some of these guys do, and I'm not going to drop any particular team names, but there's definitely things that they do to just get people riled up, and it's not what they actually think. You know what I mean? That's my point. I feel like no matter tactics, who you okay. are, you should be held accountable for what you say. Whether you get paid millions of dollars or you get paid minimum wage, you are accountable for what you say. That's all I'm saying. I'm with I'm you. Like, find them. I believe find you. Find them. Do whatever. I, I'm with you 100%, but I don't think it's the league that should be making that decision. I think it should be the fans that make that decision. Yeah, you go off, point. Point. If you, if you go off running your mouth and I'm your fan, I'm going to be like, well... Done, nice yeah, knowing not, you. I'm glad I didn't buy point. that jersey yet. That's all Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No I mean, to the jersey. Right? <laughs> That's a good I point, also man. I think there's just not interesting enough um, players or athletes, if you want to call them that, to, to actually follow. So you mentioned McGregor. Um, and you've seen people in there like Mayweather, Tyson, you know, people that are, that are real characters. You mentioned Rodman as well. I can't name a professional gamer that I, I could – tell you what their personality is what they look like what they do i could tell streamers and stuff but that's not quite the same thing there's no one in there that's engaging enough they're all just kind of good at games you just see them staring at screen and clicking there's no one in there that's an entertainer there's not someone that's elevated the sport in that way i just don't know if they need to work on having you know charismatic players rather than just good players um, to, to elevate a sport. It's difficult to get behind a guy who just stares blankly at a screen for six hours and then occasionally sort of just cheers. And that's something that the sport, you know, there's only, it can only carry you so far watching someone that's good at Counter-Strike. 
Yeah, well, I, I agree with you there. You need to get into. Sure. Um, we need to get Gary into uh, esports, guys. He has the personality. He has the tone. The way he speaks to people. He he's a great character. What's going to be your game, uh, Gary? Counter Strike. Yeah. Uh, Hello Kitty Island. I'm going for. Oh fuck! Yeah, well, you're going to be the world champ at Poster Panty Snapping. Boy. In that panty one game. Snapping. Yeah, he's got panty that. How many, world how many panty snaps per minute? PSMs. <laughs> <laughs> you got going on there. <laughs> um, my PSM is like MLG status. That's where it needs to be. <laughs> I just, I just want to see people, and I want to get behind someone. If I'm going to watch gaming as a sport. I want to be saying, oh, I want to see SK Gaming because they've got this dude and this dude. He's fucking crazy. I don't know what he's going to yeah. do. You know, he's really interesting. Yeah. And when I say crazy, I don't know what he's going to do. Not like he's going to be racist on Twitter. I mean, like, you know, he, he might, might just do something really interesting in the in the game. He might showboat. He's going to he's got an intro. Like when he walks into the stadium, he does a certain thing that people get behind. Yeah. That kind of personality and showmanship that Conor McGregor's brought to UFC and now boxing that you don't see anywhere else. And I've got no interest in UFC, but I started watching UFC because Conor McGregor's such a fucking entertaining gent. You know, he's yeah. a he's a real. You gotta give it time. Guy. You gotta give the format time to develop. You, you gotta and you gotta give the stars time to develop, right? To, Conor to McGregor grow, was yeah. the first UFC guy that came around. There were a bunch of guys that you don't know before that, right? That but then huge, Conor yeah. McGregor came around and he's got some personality and he's got the skill. So now he's drawn. He's like you know. For golf, it's Tiger Woods, right? It's like a lot of people didn't watch any fucking golf till Tiger Woods came around, and all of a sudden Tiger Woods had the personality and he had the skill, right? And then everybody was watching golf. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan. You don't. There's not a Michael Jordan every fucking year, right? There's one yeah. of these guys a generation if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. All right. So the next topic is one that I was thinking of, thinking of. I, I came up with it Friday and. It's something that's kind of close to me, you know, because I'm a, a fan of this particular franchise. The future of the Resident Evil franchise, bro, we talked about this pre-show, so I'm really anxious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, the Resident Evil franchise of games has had an interesting past. At its height with games like Resident Evil 4, Code Veronica, Resident Evil Revelations, and Resident Evil 2, the series owned and honed the horror genre. Unfortunately, with later does like Resident Evil 5, 6, Umbrella Corps and Operation Raccoon City, the franchise has seen a steep decline in interest, reception, and sales. Gamers and fans of the franchise cried for the days of old when the term survival horror meant something. For a while, it seemed like actual survival horror was gone, at least in the Resident Evil franchise. But in 2017, Capcom released Resident Evil 7, a survival horror game of old with claustrophobic environments, terrifying enemies, dwindling supplies and a sense of panic and fear. I love this game and completed it in VR on my PlayStation 4 Pro. As of now, the website VG, VG Charts states that worldwide sales of Resident Evil 7 have reached 2.09 million worldwide. A little underwhelming in my opinion as Resident Evil 6 has sold 3.10 million and Part 5 sold over 5 million. With seemingly low sales on what I consider a true return to form, uh, is the future of Resident Evil? What is the future of the Resident Evil series? Do you guys think we'll get more true survival horror Resident Evils, or will Capcom go uh, toward the action-centered theme of games like Resident Evil Five and Six that have sold more than you guys uh, get all Resident that? Evil Seven? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, look, when you listed off the sales numbers, that's shocking to me. The fact that Resident Evil between Resident Evil Seven, Six, and Five. There's no question in my mind that Resident Evil 7 is by far the best game in that, in that group. And the fact that it sold less than half as many as Part 5 did and, you know, 50% less than what uh, Resident Evil 6 did Six? is insane. It's insane to me. Resident Evil 7 is a fantastic game. And I wonder if it got... If it got marred by the fact that it was VR. I wonder oh, if people didn't not. pick it up because they said, oh, this game was built for VR. I, I know I could play it on my PlayStation or on my PC, but it was really, you know, I think it's supposed to be a VR game. So maybe I'll wait till I get VR. Can that's I be a, honest? That's yeah. why I didn't pick it up. Yeah. Because it looked like more fun in VR. I felt like oh, if I is. played it on console, I wasn't getting the full experience and to like, see a lot of the jump scares that people were getting in VR. Like, I watched you and Tefty stream at Briar, and it was absolutely hilarious, the jump scares. You know, even um, 
sub alerts when you guys would be streaming it and a sub alert would come in. That was <laughs> that was probably better than some of the actual intentional <laughs> jump scares, to be honest. I mean, but I that's... picked it up, but Go I didn't. Ahead, Gary. I guess I I kind of regretted picking it up. Um, something that sat on the shelf. I never completed it. I got through. I didn't even get to the first real boss. I kind of played a bit of it. And what put me off, and I think what put a lot of gamers off picking it up, was just how scary it was. So games like Outlast and games that are really survival horror-esque are always niche games. They're never going to be big, popular games that are going to dominate the charts because there's not that many people that like horror movies and like to be scared. I'd play Resident Evil 2 or 3. I think the last one I played was probably 2, actually. Um, because they weren't that scary. They were zombies in them, but zombies that I could deal with and that they weren't terrifying. I'd rather play an action game that's based in a, a zombie environment than a horror game myself because I don't like being scared. So do you think it could be at least instigated by that, that people just didn't want to feel that afraid? I... I, I just can't I, I can't see that as being a valid reason. Uh, I think the horror genre is just as huge as it's always been. You know, people yeah, but, I love I mean, horror. Horror horror movies don't, you know, pack them in like, you know, an Avengers movie does, right? Absolutely. They don't not, pack no. it in. You know, they're not the most popular because movies. Because there are out restrictions. There. They're usually restrictions. You can't take your there. family to yeah, they're restrictions. You know, a lot your family, of the... a lot of your family doesn't want to go see it. You know, like I don't like horror movies. I don't like horror games. I loved Resident it. Evil My Seven parents, was really I fucking, fucking good. Love them. There's nothing better than that for me. I saw Friday the Thirteenth in the movie theater. Several of them in uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets with my parents growing up. Jason you know, takes. Manhattan. I understand that a lot of people do like them. I don't like them. If I'm gonna go watch a piece of entertainment or play a video game, I like having like a power fantasy or laughing the whole time instead of shitting my pants the whole time, wondering if this dumb bitch who's going into the basement fucking alone. <laughs> is gonna get her, you know, face chopped off. Of course she is. She's gonna run just, first, and then she's gonna fall. To but be yeah, honest, I haven't had a game or a movie like scare me in a long time. And it's funny that you bring up Resident Evil because that's one of the last games that actually gave me a terrifying feeling. Um, that uh, the first one was the dog chase. They like yeah, jump through the, the windows through the window, and stuff. Yeah. I got mauled pretty hard growing up by a dog like first time i had to get stitches it was like 198 stitches i was oh, in like the fourth geez. grade that scene terrified me not just because i'd gotten bit by the dog but that feeling of there's something on your ass that just it's right behind you and if you slip up for even a second You're done. that's it and that's the last time i can remember getting that feeling from a video game or even a movie for that matter like so it wasn't necessarily like a scary thing that kept me from buying it it's just that I didn't really want to spring the cash for VR for one game because that that was the only game that really interested me. Yeah. For uh, VR because I I enjoy being scared for a little bit. That's the cool thing about movies and games. If you get scared, you can you can walk away from it. You know what I mean? Like you can remove yourself from the situation. That actually made me want to purchase a VR more than anything. Is a game like that. Like if I can be put into that that universe and actually be scared to the points where I think something's behind me. Like that's good money spent. Man, it, it's it's the Re resident evil seven for, for PlayStation VR is what the legend of Zelda is for the Nintendo switch. It's the pivotal title. It's the best experience I think you can have overall. And it's unfortunate that some you, people can't you like it better you know, than super hot. Yeah, it's better than super hot. Super hot's a lot of fun, but it's very, it, it's, it's a lot of the same. Resident Evil feels like it's more of a complete experience. It That's is fair. you fair. you're there and, and you feel like you're there. There's so much going on and everywhere you look, you just you feel like there could be something around every corner and the story is amazing. And I, you know, I it took me a while to get back into it, Briar, but I actually went back and I completed it. And the end boss is unbelievably terrifying in VR. You know, I literally felt like I was going to piss my pants when this thing was coming after me. Uh, it's it's a special kind of experience. And, and I'm wondering what Capcom's going to do because, of course, the the prime objective of any company is positive revenue. And if they see that they're making a lot more money on games that have Chris Redfield punching boulders, and you know you got Leon Kennedy sliding across the floor in slow motion like the Matrix, versus a game that is truly survival horror where you have limited supplies, claustrophobic environment, terrifying enemies around every corner, will they? forego what true survival horror is and go toward this action-oriented genre that happens to just have zombies in it. And, I mean, we don't get enough games like that anymore. Dead Space is a great example of true survival horror. That was an amazing experience, both Dead Space games, actually. 
And uh, three, of course, there? Res- yeah, there are three, but the first two to me were the the bee's knees of, of survival horror. They they kind of went the the way of Capcom as well later on and, and started to put a little bit more action. Not as much as Capcom Isn't that because did. you're 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 kind of. You know, you're limiting your audience, though, because you're making a horror game, right? There's just not, the like Gary said, there's not as big an audience for horror games that there is for yeah. an action game. I yeah, was but- really into VR at the time, and that came out really into VR. I still am, um, to be fair, from an Oculus perspective or PC. I don't even own a PSVR anymore. But when I was reading the forums as to why people weren't picking it up or were they going to pick it up in VR, from a VR forum perspective, the overwhelming feedback I was seeing everywhere was, love to play this game i don't like scary games i don't like being scared i don't like feeling scared and that's for me is like i i wouldn't choose to spend my time and money feeling afraid i I don't see any value in it i have no enjoyment in it whatsoever if the vr game if i was playing resident evil and i could play it in a mode where i had loads of ammo and i could just shoot loads of zombies whatever i'd probably play it Uh, you know for me the feeling of powerlessness and feeling terrified I have zero interest in it. I would, but that was also its know. greatest strength because yes. you weren't you weren't playing a third person character. It was you. You, you know, like yeah. I was there. I was running away from these fucking spiders, and I was running away from this fucking asshole trap guy, and like it, it felt so fucking real. I don't like horror games, but I had to. I had to applaud them for just making one of the best. VR games that I've ever played. But and, now you've narrowed down your audience twice because some people just won't play horror games and some people, you know, saw it as a VR game, not as a game. Right? So yeah. it makes sense. Two two million for a VR game is fantastic. Two million for uh for a Resident Evil game, not great. Yeah, uh and, and I agree with you guys. You know, I, I see your point, and maybe Capcom in the future can market their games as you know, regular standalone experiences and not particularly go for the jugular with VR. But cer- some people, Gary, feel the exact opposite when it comes to horror. I think that that feeling of yeah, being but beastly, incredibly... It's, you, you can't look at your own personal experience. You have to look at, like, the, how many people... You're talking about the out majority. Of a potential, yeah. How many people out of a potential audience that we want to sell... You know, we want to. We we've got a five million dollar or five million sales target, right? We want to sell five million copies of this game because, and we think we can because Resident Evil Five, Resident Evil Six sold five million copies. This game's even better, so we should be able to surpass that that target. Well, why did we fail? And that's what you got to start looking at. Well, we reduced our audience because we made it a VR game, and we reduced our audience because it was too it leaned too heavily on horror, whereas. You know, since what Resident Evil Four, they've really been starting to go more on the action side. Yeah, well, that, I guess that's the gist of the question. Uh, do you guys think that future Resident Evil games will go back towards action and I forget so. this and forget this true survival horror kind of experience? It's unfortunate for me, you know, and it's it's a bittersweet thing because not we don't get this very often, uh, the kind of experience that Resident Evil Seven was. And for me no. to see to see Capcom go back the opposite direction kind of breaks my heart. But I understand the business aspect of it that they have to make their money, and, and who knows? I mean, look at the reception of games like uh, Hideo Kojima's not Silent Silent Hills that demo that came out. Uh, what's it called? Um, PT. PT. The reception of that that was one of the most terrifying experiences ever in a video game, and it was one of the biggest demos. Everyone on Earth was going crazy about it. I just I think that if it's done right and done done in the, the you know the right light with the right message that a horror game can be huge. I don't necessarily believe that it's because people are afraid of horror. Horror is a genre. It's like comedy. You know, I, 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 like I think yeah, except is, it sells and, half as good as comedy. Yeah, I just feel like <laughs> horror is a really lazy late and then this is again my perspective on it. I feel like creating a horror game is quite a lazy thing, like putting jump scares into a game. It's it's not great storytelling. You know, you can do jump scares. That's all well and good. You Resident can Evil wasn't scared. like that, though. Yeah, I oh, would agree with Beasley I there. I mean, for, I would agree, Gary, perspective. most of the time, especially horror movies, feel fucking oh, lazy. Fucking they just do the suck. same fucking thing over and over again and just play on jump scares. Mm-hmm. Resident Evil 7 was special. It, the, they did a lot of cool stuff with that game. They did a lot and of stuff with the story. atmosphere. The, the character design was fantastic. There was there was arcs to the characters where you wouldn't definitely wouldn't expect it. It was a fantastic game. 
I, mean, I feel I'm like just... it will go back to that old style, and I feel like it was just kind of too soon, maybe ahead of its time, maybe a little bit. Like, it was just too soon to drop uh, that in-depth of a horror VR experience while people are just starting to dip but, their toes into VR. Do you guys just... remember what we talked about before PSVR came out? We were talking about what types of games were the best VR experiences, and, and I, I remember distinctly that many of us said that horror was the best thing for VR. Now that we got an amazing horror game, it's like now it, we're getting. I definitely the exact... never said that. <laughs> no, no, no I, I don't think that you did. I, I, I think that um, it was on our old show. We we actually talked about it, and of course, you let it be known, Brian, that you're you're, you're pretty afraid of horror games. But I'm not afraid for... of horror. Look, I'll tell you, I am afraid of horror. Like, if it, good horror <laughs> Take it back. does make me scared, but for the most part, horror horror movies, especially, they're fucking terrible movies. Like, they're just yeah. bad. You're like right. they, they just do a bad job of making these movies. So it's not even entertaining, you know? Mm -hmm. I but, just think for me, could there be a happy the point I was trying to to get to there around horror being lazy is I think good zombie or good post apocalyptic or horror esque games can be achieved without them needing to be scary. So I know, um, BC, this is something close to your heart, and it's a game that I really enjoyed and didn't feel scared playing, but did feel enthralled playing. And Say that's it. The Last of Us. Thank you. So the Last of Us to me is a game set in a pretty horrific place. You know, the world's destroyed. There's these terrifying creatures that are stalking you around. I didn't feel scared, though. I felt engaged. The story motivated me, moved me. It wasn't jump scary. There was no cheap scares in it. Um, it was scary what you thought what's going to happen to Ellie and what's going to happen in, in this relationship. Um, you know, and there were certainly some tense moments, but there wasn't jump scares. So could Resident Evil maybe take a lesson from that and think we've lent too heavy on the on the horror. Previously we've gone too hard on the action. Could we tell a strong story narrative that kind of goes through the middle? And would that be a, a sweet That's spot? what I feel like Resident Evil Summit did. It did. It totally yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. Gary, you, you need to play that game, man. Even if you play it on PC. Well, is it on PC? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Play it on PC. <laughs> don't play it on VR. Just play it on ultra settings and, yeah. and play it. And you'll you'll kind of understand where, where Briar and I are talking about. The first this hour of Resident Evil 7, it, it leans on the horror stuff pretty hard, right? Like, you know, like ch chainsawing your hand off and, and jump yeah. scares. And then it de starts developing its story. And it does a pretty good job at that. There's a... About three quarter of the way in, you start losing track of the story a little bit, and it doesn't really, uh, it never really comes together like it it should have. But it does. A, it's got compelling characters. It's got a compelling story, and I think it does a damn good job of kind of keeping you on your toes about, you know, who are these characters, what happened to them to get them to where they are, and you know that's really what dro drove me through the game. Yeah. And the action is pretty intense. I mean, it's not like you're running around with a flashlight. You got rocket launchers, shotguns. I mean, you feel like a badass in this world. I think that they married it perfectly. It's just kind of unfortunate to see the outcome of only 2.09 million sales. And I remember uh, one of the, the the people who worked on the project was expecting five million in the first month. So I wonder you know, they, if uh, I wonder if this game will be a slow burn for Capcom. Like it's just gonna keep selling. You know, like as the christmas holiday comes around and a bunch of people new people get psvr is this going to be on their wish list for their psvr it needs to be if yeah. they ever update vr compatibility into the steam release is that is that going to sell a bunch more copies f for them on pc yeah you know, that like was I, a timed exclusive uh, 12 months so it will be coming out yeah in was it october november I don't know, that was whenever. a rumor though. was that confirmed by capcom that, that was, it was the time <laughs> That was confirmed. It was coming okay. to the PC after 12 months. I, I got a quick question before we move on, because I think we've thoroughly fleshed out uh, our thoughts on this. Briar, I know that you you're, you you shy away from horror uh, mostly. What was your reason behind picking this game up? Did you just get it because of the hype? Or uh, it was the best it? looking VR game that I'd ever seen. I also knew that I could stream it. Uh, there, was, there was no small part of it. And uh, being able to stream it meant that it was like having somebody in the room with me holding my hand. Yeah, I love that stream. It was so good. Wilson, do you, uh, do you guys to... think it could have done a little better, like if it was developed separately, like if there was a standalone for console and a standalone for VR? No. You don't because think it would have done any better? It, it is a standalone for console. When you switch off VR mode, it looks much better. It looks like any regular PS4, Xbox One, or PC game. It, yeah, but it didn't look, look like it felt that way. It looked like it felt very sluggish, like very slow movement. Like, no? 
No, totally no, not. Not, it not was, any more it, than a normal Resident Evil. No, game. It, it it well, it's a different type of Resident Evil, but it was it was a first person experience, right? And it, and it felt smooth and responsive, and it wasn't slow or sluggish when you turned off VR. It's just when you go into VR, you're just in the damn game. So to me, it was a double whammy of, of wow. And when I turned off the VR to experience it on my my 4K. It looked like any other PS4, Xbox One game I played. So. so, what if they had done this? What if they had released the game for you know console and PC without VR support, and then the first DLC was VR support? That would have been that would have been huge. I think that would have been huge. It probably would have been their best thing. But you know, the fact that they promoted this on PlayStation, I think that they wanted to get VR hyped as well to kind yeah. of push the PS VR. But like, hype how trend. do you have a five million dollars? sales target or a 5 million copy sales target when there's 200,000 PSVRs out there, you know, like and you're marketing it as a PSVR game. I know that it's not, you don't need a PSVR to play it, but you marketed it as a PSVR game. Sony was marketing it as like the coolest thing in PSVR. The demo was a PSVR demo, you know, like they marketed that thing as a VR game. So, I mean, I, mean I, I would like to see more of that, frankly. I would love to see Resident Evil 8 come out for VR, but, I mean, if they feel like they got bit by putting this game out for VR, they're not going to do that. Unfortunate. That's very sad. What do we got for the next topic? Uh, we're going to do a completionist versus casual playthrough of games. So when you start playing a game that you really enjoy, are you the kind of gamer that, because you're really enjoying the game, you want to try to 100% it, get everything done, all the side quest maybe a new game plus uh playthrough are you the kind of gamer that just wants to get through the story and only do a few side quests until you get tired of them uh maybe do just enough stuff to get through the main quest line and move on to the next game and i think there's a few benefits to both of what kind of gamer you are if you're a completionist or casual for lack of a better term sorry i couldn't think of a better term other than casual but um, one of the benefits, in my opinion, to like being a completionist, like you get your money's worth from the game, obviously, because sometimes, um, I mean, some games with new game plus modes and multiple endings and things like that, you can end up sinking, you know, over 100 hours into a game. And not to mention, you get to experience some of the most OP weapons and challenging encounters in some of these games. Now, most of that relates to, you know, RPGs and stuff like that. But if you really take your time, to go through and 100% a game, you know, you might find a weapon or an item that hasn't been tuned like it should be. It might be a little broken. So you can have some interesting playthroughs that way. Um, part of the benefits of uh, benefits of a casual playthrough, you, um, you're not as tight, you're not as time constrained to playing that game. So if you're the type of person that just likes to experience the main story and get through the game and stuff like that, you have chances to do that with other games. Um, Whereas, like, I used to be a trophy hunter for PlayStation. I could not move on to another game until I platinumed it. You know, mm. it took me a long time to get to some of these games. And granted, they were cheaper by the time that I got to them, but nobody else was playing them. You know what I mean? Like, so grinding isn't for everyone, and 100%ing a game can feel like a bit of a grind. So I understand that's a turnoff. But basically, I just wanted to know what kind of gamer are you guys? Are you a completionist? Or are you someone who just likes to get through the main story? Uh, I, I'm completely subjective. If, if a game, if I start playing a game and I think it's amazing and I feel rewarded just for playing it, I'm motivated to play all of it. I did that with Horizon Zero Dawn. I, I 100% of that game. Uh, the Batman Arkham series, I 100% it. Uh, of course, The Last of Us, 100% of the game. But some some games are just good enough that you want to just play it, experience it, and put it behind you after you see the credits roll. And so for me, it, it all really depends if a game, I, if I personally feel a connection to a game, you know, during the first few hours of playing it and experiencing it, and I feel rewarded just by playing it, then I want to play it more. And I want to see everything, every nook and cranny that's in that game. And in some games you feel you enjoy, you think they're good enough games, but you're not motivated to search for every nook and cranny and, and search for every trophy. Uh, but you you're, you feel rewarded enough just by beating the game. And so for me, I'm completely subjective. If I love it, I'm going to do it. If I like it, I'm just going to play it through. Guys? Gary? Yeah, so for me, I've 
never been a completionist with games. I'm a completionist in everything else in my life. I'm really OCD with like, if I'm collecting manga or like anime, I've got to have like every one of the series. If I buy games, I've got to buy like one, two and three, even if I'm only going to play three, like I have to have everything. When I play a game though, very little bothers me. Achievements, I've never cared at all about achievements. Achievements for me started actually in World of Warcraft. Um, where they introduced an achievement system in the game to like doing different things. So there was like, they introduced trophies within the game. I had zero care. I, I If you tell me what your gamer score is or how many trophies you've got, I don't care. Like I would immediately switch off. Like I have zero care about what you've got. For it's me, like there's telling no... telling me about how cute your baby is. I just don't give a shit. Exactly that. I mean, they're all, they all look like I have so many men, platinums. You need to matter. see this, okay? Do you know yeah. how long it took to get the platinum in Mercenaries? Yeah, I bet your kid yeah, is it, really smart, too. Like a week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's because there's no value in the currency, um, I don't care. So, what would make me more interested is if you could, I don't know if it would be DLC locked, but you know, like the cosmetic stuff, like new skins, new armors, etc. If you could either buy them with real cash or if you could unlock, like, use your achievement points to purchase something for the game, then maybe I'd be more interested in it. But the fact that you give me nothing for it and you're just taking my time and giving me some some number on a thing, I don't know, zero interest in completionism. But it's making the e much bigger, no, yeah. <laughs> it actually works a different way. It gets smaller the larger the number is. It's like buying an expensive car. Um, I, I kind of, I kind of side with Gary here on this one. Um, there's been very few games where I felt like I needed to see everything, but when I have felt it, like I felt it strong. Fallout Three was, I beat the game, then went right back in, and I wanted to see, I wanted to see every nook and corner of that world. But it wasn't for achievements; it was because just the world they had built such a cool and beautiful world and that just I just wanted, wanted to, to find it. everything. I just wanted to see everything that was available, content-wise, to that. Destiny, you know, obviously I've played a lot of fucking Destiny, but that was different because I'm not achievement hunting in that game. It's more of I want to, I guess it's a form of achievement hunting because I want to constantly be grinded for new gear so I could, I'm powerful enough to go into the raid with my buddies. And then, you know, I like multiplayer gaming. I like competitive multiplayer. So it's fun for me to jump in and have the coolest fucking guns to go blast people with in, in Destiny's crucible you know so that's right. a little bit of different thing but like if i play like hellblade i'll never probably play hellblade again i'm just not that kind of person i've experienced that once and i'm done i never played bioshock again i played it once i, I fucking loved it and i moved on you know there's a ton of games like that that i'm just not mm. i don't care about the i don't care about the achievements i don't care about the gamer score uh, it's more about the experience and i want to have as many awesome experiences as i can I guess like gamer score world. and trophies were like a bad, like it doesn't, completing a game or 100%ing a game doesn't necessarily mean that you got all the trophies or the achievements for it. Like, and you had mentioned Destiny, you know, getting all the exotics, doing all the content. Like the first time I made it to the lighthouse, like, yeah, I was excited to get the loot, but yeah. I was more excited that I had at that point officially completed all the content that Destiny had thrown at me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you could say you've played Trial, Trials of Osiris, and this isn't me being elitist, but Sounds until, like you, until you make it to the lighthouse... It makes you feel elite, in there, You know, it does. Like, it makes I, you feel elite, and it's a good feeling to go to the lighthouse. It's a good feeling yeah. to complete a raid, especially if you do it, like, in the first raid. couple of days a raid is available. You feel like you're, you know, you're one of the few. It's a very similar it's feeling proud. with the raid, completing the raid for the first time and going to... The lighthouse for the first time but it's more of a sense that like this content was put in the game and until i achieve achieve said goal i can't physically walk around and experience it like yeah you get loot and stuff like that but like i said like gamer score in trophies and stuff like that like that's not necessarily like 100 percenting a game in my opinion just like if you want to experience all the content that the game has to offer or you know, you're going to grind it out for Dreg's promise that you're probably not going to use, but you want that spot filled out on your kiosk. You know what I mean? Like, just to say that you do have it or that you've been there, done that with 100% of the game. You know what I mean? And I think I'm kind of with you guys. Like, if the game's interesting, of course. I'm going to jump in, do as much of it as I can until it isn't interesting to me anymore. And if a game is just interesting enough to keep me through the campaign, yeah, I'll probably 
probably drop it like a hot potato once I get through it. So. Side note, I hope Destiny 2 has a better way for people to get in together to do raids. I just didn't have a ton there of friends do. in Destiny. You oh, had yeah. all the friends in the world. Huh? No, you had me. <laughs> I you can ain't, you ain't raid four team. other people. Dude, yeah, I can fill up a raid now. team. Like, the, the, Let's the go do a raid had... right now. We can fill up a raid team. <laughs> they they do they do beastly they do have a new thing where what was it called like uh something something to do with the clans curated the preferred games, clans curated cl- guided games guided, guided games game, yeah. so yeah basically you fill out a questionnaire saying what you want to get out of the raid experience and based upon what other people have filled out on who they're looking for in their raid it'll match you up so it's basically oh, like sweet. a personality match it's the uh what is it like a, an internet dating It'll match you up based on you know sim- for match.com for destiny basically. Yeah, so yeah. you're you good. Guys heard you don't that need there's that's... 80 missions. It, uh, Edge magazine no, released an article. That's, that's been misquoted. There's 80 oh, really? PVE activities. Oh, okay. I heard there was so, 50 plus missions. Yeah, there's there lot. might be 50 plus missions. It might not, but Destiny One at launch, if you added it all up, because they're including strikes, public events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, destiny One had 55. So this has got more than destiny one had at launch but destiny one at launch was pretty bare bones so yeah, take it how you want it could be 80 really really chunky meaningful activities or it could be 80 very lightweight ones but it's not 80 missions no that's been clarified that that's too bad that was hype. Yeah, that yeah. sounded intense yeah. Man, <laughs> that's your yeah. money's worth right there dude. sorry i just i slapped your boner right on the end of it right there with the news okay. i'd rather like, i'd rather boy. you do it now than let me just like Sustain this boner for yeah. hours and hours. <laughs> Back down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, putting it in it's, check. I mean, it is what it is. A completionism, if you're calling completionism completing a game, then yeah, I try to complete games unless I'm really not enjoying the game. Then I'll put it down. Like Resident Evil 7 was one that I didn't complete because I really wasn't enjoying it. Um, just comes to mind because we were talking about it. But yeah, I mean, I play games that I, you can't complete. Things like MMOs, where there is no completion. Destiny, I guess you can't really complete. You can Sounds complete. Sounds like a cop out for a while. I think you can complete it, Gary. I just think I just yeah. think you haven't think you devoted haven't. enough time to it yet. I think you need to be serious and yeah. devote at stop, least stop fucking around. At least twenty thousand hours to it. Yeah. Then we can have this conversation. <laughs> Sorry to cut <laughs> you off there, but I had to. <laughs> time to get another PC to sit next to to you while you do the show, I've, so you can multitask. I've, I've got two. I, I could be on it right now. You guys just don't know it. You probably are. <laughs> probably am. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> completionism. What do we do? We think that completionism then is because to my take on your question, there was trophies and, and achievements. Okay. In which case, I'd say no. If you call completionist completing games, then probably yeah. I like to see the end credits. Like if that's what you're talking about, I like to see the yeah. last. Once but I don't there, necessarily like start start in on the new game plus and. Collected every single weapon and every piece of armor. Like Horizon Zero Dawn, for instance. I like that game. But, man, I mainlined that story and just... It was out of my life. Like, yeah. I never looked back. can't help it, man. Did it's you like play that just... thing sometimes. When I really enjoy a game, I want everything in the game. And, like, I take it to the extreme of, like, I want every skill tree maxed out. I want Please. every possible weapon found. I can't help it, man. Like, I, I mean, it's, it's put in the game for me to experience. You know what I mean? And... So many times I have found something that if I had not ventured off to do that to max out a specific skill tree, like I wouldn't be like you can find some really OP builds and some really OP stuff. And like, yeah, that's it it makes the game easier or whatever. But sometimes it's fun, dude, to just find something that's just broke as shit and run through the area and destroy everyone. You know what I mean? And you might not have found it had you just stuck to the the yellow brick road, so to speak. Like, that's just my opinion, though. All right, so moving on to the sixth topic, revolving to the last. Now, this is for the co-hosts and for you guys watching and listening. I want to know in the comments what your thoughts are on this last topic. Desert Island Gaming. Okay, you find yourself stranded on an island, alone and wondering where you are. You stumble across a lamp, and upon picking it up, a huge genie pops out of it and says, Pick wisely. You have three choices of game. (laughs) You have three choices of games. One first-person shooter, one single-player game, and any game of any genre. All online components, modes, and extras, including voice chat, will be enabled, and I will supply you with food and drink for the rest of your life of solitude. 
what do you pick? You get a first person shooter, a single player game, and any game of any genre of your choosing. Now to make this easy, I want to go first. My choices for first person shooter are Overwatch. I, I feel like every single time you play that game, it's a completely different experience. And there's so many characters and so many different ways to play it. It's amazing. My single player game with online modes and functions would be The Last of Us because I love that world so much. And it has an incredible online mode. So it's two games. And my last game, which is a game of any genre, would be World of Warcraft because I feel like I could probably play that game for 50 years and do something different every day and still have fun. So those are my choices. I can't wait to hear you guys' choices in the comments. And of course, I was able to play that game for a day without doing the same thing fucking over and over again. <laughs> well, to be fair, you didn't have Gary. You didn't have the sultry, sweet sounds yeah, of the Gary. Yeah, the sounds of Gary. <laughs> I could have taken you yeah. under my wing and guided you Ooh. like a newborn bird sounds through so the, good. the world. Ooh, even him just saying that. It's giving, I'm logging in. Right now. It's like a warm blanket. <laughs> like, oh, I feel good. Man, I feel so <laughs> secure and safe in here. You could have been my tavern wench. It would have been fantastic. <laughs> okay, it doesn't feel good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what do you uh, what do you guys think about this? It's gonna take you? a little bit of thought for me so if anybody that's else already has one. their answers yeah that's a very tough one for first that's... person shooter it's obviously destiny, destiny any two, of the destiny right? franchise destiny now the yeah. single player game can have an online mode but it's just a game that's mostly a single player experience and of course the last game is any that's game the of hardest any one i think is the single player because it's like I can't think of a single player that I'm not going to get bored with eventually. Final Fantasy VII. That's Ooh. my single player. So Ooh, I'm going to go good. with Destiny for first-person shooter. Final Fantasy VII because we're good. talking about completing games and that has oh, shit in it. That's and then game. the third choice was just any any genre of my choosing. Any genre, any game of all time. I'm going to have to say wow so I can hear Gary's voice. I yeah. Mean, I'm going to have to say wow because like... It's the perfect game. You're on a desert island for the rest of your life, and this genie's yeah. just going to give you food and drink, and like all yeah. you got to do is play this game. Like, what else are you going to play? Yeah, fucking wow. I mean, to me, this this <laughs> question itself is um, is misguided, man. You need three MMOs. It, you're talking about games that require time. <laughs> Why are you fucking around in a single player game? You're on this <laughs> island. Hey, man, it's what the genie said, not me. Okay, Gary, I'm just reading you what he said. If well, not I'm Final gonna... Fantasy VII, I would say Chrono Trigger so I could experience Ooh. all 13 endings. Yeah, that's a yeah. good one. <clears throat> then once you've played all 13 endings, what do you do? You Let's play WoW. Again. You go play <laughs> WoW. It's like when you get done doing anything at that point, you'd go play WoW. By the time WoW, you get done with the 13th, you'll have forgotten the first one. So wait, a well. yeah. <laughs> yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Cycle it. This game, it, what, what else do you have on this desert island? Is it just You've just got three games on this island. Is that right? Yeah. You got no TV, no phone, no nothing else. Just, I, we're talking about gaming here. You can have the Playboy channel if you want, Gary. I'll throw that no, in. Because no, no. okay? if you don't have the Playboy channel, then one of them needs to be gal guns. You can snap some Japanese panties because that's the only entertainment you're going to have <laughs> in that space forever. Is that, is that one of your choices, Gary? Not, he doesn't have Playboy. He has Play Gents, the gentleman, the Play Gentleman <laughs> Club. <laughs> well, I'm saying, you know, you're going to need some sort of Leisure Suite Larry or whatever the equivalent is, you know, like summer vacation kind of thing. Yeah. Dead or live volleyball. Got. Man, you, you're going to be trying to, like, arrange seaweed into interesting pornographic shapes by the end of it. Like, you've got no <laughs> stimulus for, like... Drawn in the Gary, sand. Gary it. took the question straight to the fucking gutter. I love it. You're <laughs> watching, like, seagulls boning and trying to get off on it by the end of it. I mean, you, you are here on this island forever. You've can't got you, the internet. You, there's online you, gaming. You've got the internet. Like, there's plenty of... the internet for You gaming. don't need to draw seaweed. There's Somebody's already done it for you on the internet, man. Yeah. And it's probably way more detailed than what you could come up with. So, yeah, you've right. got the internet. Plus, Gary, you could form a real relationship in World of Warcraft. You can get married to an actual girl playing a video game from around the world. Talk to her. You guys have, like, World of Warcraft chatting, sex, and all of a sudden you're beating off behind a tree somewhere. I mean, it could work on a desert island. Do you have to go behind the tree on the I island? I mean, if there's nobody there. You're on a deserted <laughs> island. Why do you have to hide it? <laughs> yeah. I just yeah, want it at that just, point. Oh, yeah, no shame in the free. game. Let it run free. I mean, what is this? Is this island too hot as well? Is it a cold island? Is it a warm island? What's it it's like? Is there rain? Island, Perfect. Gary. It is your, it's the reason why you would be there in the first place to find the genie. <laughs> All right, because I don't like gaming in the heat as well, because that's something else there. Because any of these games here, I wouldn't want to play in the heat. 
like when it's too warm it's just not nice it's not comfortable the mouse is very sweaty it's not this isn't goldilocks this is gaming this is not you don't need to find one that's just (laughs) right you know what i mean like this is your island gary this is your picture perfect area however you you want to be gary you said all components are most do i have a desk yes i have a monitor what monitors do i have you have whatever monitor you want all the hertz all the hertz Thousand mm. hertz. Mm-hmm. <laughs> thousand hertz, you say? That, that opens the question wider. <laughs> I don't know. To me, like I'm less concerned with what games I've got, but more the setting that I've got to play them in. He just doesn't want to admit that he'd only play WoW. Fuck the other <laughs> games. Much. He just wants WoW. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if I'm talking about what games I play, then for me, it would it would just be three MMOs because, okay. like I said, Overwatch. How long can you honestly play Overwatch for? Your placement games. That's it. Destiny. Yeah, I mean, you can play it for a while, but it is what it is. And a single player game, I want to bounce off that hard, but MMOs. Yeah, the single player three game MMOs. Is death. What I'm looking at is I want every game to be a game of service, right? So it's always going to be changing, right? So even though I selected a game, the game itself is going to change over time. So I'll constantly be yeah. getting new content. So I'd be looking at things like Destiny 2, you know, Warframe, uh, <laughs> Path, of the, Path of Exile, Warcraft, Final Fantasy 14, like that's the kind of area yeah. I'd be looking at. It's stuff that I'm constantly going to be getting new activities and new, new story and new stuff to do. But eventually, like if you pick one of those games, like when Destiny 3 comes out, You're that's fucked. it. When Warcraft 2 comes out, that's uh. it. So eventually, like do they shut off those servers? Unless, they can't shut I mean, We're talking server. like long term here. We're talking like we're gonna be stuck on this thing for like seventy years. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, actually, well, then... if you're on an island, you've got no access to medication. You'll probably be dead of dysentery and malnutrition in a couple of years. You've not got that long. <laughs> Ooh, Oregon Trail. That's a good game. Dys- oh, dysentery. Oregon that's Trail. a good one. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Tropico, you could build your own civilization and yeah. wish that you were living there. Instead, you're on this fucking island on your own, doing nothing. I mean, it would have to be a game that they would 100% be adding to for the rest of your life. Because let's be real, the only answer there is World of Warcraft. Because if they shut that game down, people are going to fucking riot. This is the only game that could potentially be around, <laughs> you know? like. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm reading this silly comment. I'm going to go through some of these comments. I read that one too by ass. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good one. Ash in the it, for the podcast listeners, Ash in the comments section said, the genie is actually beastly. When Gary asks for his game, so just throw a basic PS4 at him and leave. <laughs> and that will provide firewood for at least one evening. So <laughs> do me a favor, really. Oh man. I mean, right. don't have, yeah, it's an interesting topic. I mean, I'm just thinking about would I want to play this stuff or would I want to just get my get my sort of Tom Hanks cast away on and sort of be yelling Wilson at a ball and doing that sort of thing. Gaming's probably the last of my concerns. What about beer? Can the genie give us beer? Sure. Any any type of sustenance you oh want. Oh my god. I'd be using food and drink for the rest of your life. Yeah, that qualifies the rest of your life drink. from solitude. Sometimes food. Imagine <laughs> imagine the internet trolling that Gary would get up to if he had unlimited time and unlimited uh, alcohol. <laughs> That's it. If you just give me Twitter and a load of accounts, that's it. I'm going to be the egg that just trolls everyone. I mean, I'm gone. I'm away. Good luck trolling NASA, man. They're pretty prudish about about people trolling them. I hear they ban. They'll ban you from, they, they'll ban you from their live stream in a, in a fucking instant, man, for being a critical thinker. Do all four of us have our own islands as well, or is it one island with four quadrants, like the Hunger Games? Individual islands. We all have our own islands, islands. and they're they all got uh, Ethernet running to them, except for Beastly. He's got shitty Wi Fi. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to be beaten off behind a tree, Gary. You get your own island, all right? (laughs) That's all I can say. That's part of my concern because I don't have clothing. I'm sitting there bare ass naked playing World of Warcraft on a fucking beach somewhere using a palm tree as shade because I can't see the monitor because it's glare. No, it's just think of glare, think of sand in your components. Yeah, you could leave. Yeah, you components, know, all right. Would you, would you, man, I mean, you're, you're forgetting the obvious. The genie can make all this stuff go away. He's not asking for three wishes. He's asking for three games. He's definitely going to hang out and make sure that shit works. He's got to give right. you food for the rest of his life. That was like, do we get the, to, like, custom order a PC, too, from the genie whenever we want? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, new game comes out. I'm thinking, hey, you know, quad 1080 Ti SLI rig sounds pretty good, genie. Make yeah, it fucking happen. 
Yeah. And that's yeah. going to be shit in like five years' time. The genie's magic PC that he's given you is going to be whole shit. Oh, wait, I can't. I can't. Like in five years, I'm stuck with this one PC forever. No, 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 no. This is this is my topic. It'll change to whatever you want, Briar. In the future, if it becomes obsolete. You just snap your finger, the genie pops back up and says, he's eating a Moe's burrito, looks at you and says, oh, you need a new one? Voila. Shazam. Genie, take me oh, to the like, fucking mainland. What the fuck? You can, yeah, oh, you can like, automatically create these fucking he, $10,000 game machines. He's machine. actually confined to the island, too. He's been watching you for the last yeah, few years. Yeah, that's what he tells this you. Uh, genie he's watching like some off by the tree. Geek, man. That's why we're hiding. There, like, <laughs> he's performing monkey to sit and play games for him naked while he watches me beat off for eternity. True. <laughs> true his own personal ESL. Show, basically. <laughs> I've got more questions about what sort of operation this genie's running. <laughs> How did I arrive on this island? Did he put me there? Or yeah, did that's I, a good like... question. The truth is, Gary, you are actually improving his gamer score in, in the genie world. <laughs> Every so time he, you play a so game. I'm his slave. Yeah. yeah. So he's you're telling me that he's got a he's life of so well. He's going to feed you, give you video games. Whatever you want. And you don't got to you don't gotta do shit for the rest of your life. Where's this fucking island? A thousand I want to know. Like, I'm yeah, really, I'm thinking about hertz. moving there. I want to go. I'm not sold, man. Bring Sam with me. Man, you've given me a very gilded cage, but I'm still a cage bird. I need to fly free. I need to know that I can leave when I want to. I'm stuck know, on this island. We're basically talking him. about my dog's life right now, and that motherfucker looks pretty happy all the time. You got that right. <laughs> Shit. Uh, real story, side note. Last night, Kate was going to bed with Ellie. I was laying on the couch, and she came in the living room and said, was one of the cats trapped in our room today? I said, no. She said, oh, one of them no. shit on our bed. I couldn't fucking believe it. And you didn't have a genie to say, clean that shit up. Yeah, I was up until about <laughs> five in the morning, feeling sick, washing clothes, washing uh, sheets and, and uh, blankets and pillowcases. It was horrible. It's unfortunate. It feels bad. Uh, what a way to bring the mood down. Thanks yeah. for that. Wow. Yeah. I like it. I was on cloud nine. That was my way of making you feel good about the <laughs> island. Go back to the island and pick your fucking games, Gary. <laughs> right? You know where cats love to shit? Sand. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> that fucking island's filled with cat shit. <laughs> you know you're getting sent food as well. I mean, what is this? Is this is food that's pre-made, or am I getting the ingredients and cooking them? How's it's this just happening? Coconut, it's just like, coconut, man. It's coconuts. It, it, you know what? All the it's coconuts like, you could possibly want. Hope you don't have an it, allergy. Adios. <laughs> it's like the Garden of Eden <laughs> where I can just sort of grab it's a like, pig and just bite into it like as it walks like by. The, what is this? It's like the duplicator on Star Trek. It's like when you, you it looks like a microwave, a you open it up. The and replicator? The you, Did you just call yeah, the replicator the duplicator? duplicator? Shut up, Briar. I know more <laughs> about fucking Star Trek than you, okay? You don't even know I'm what the fucking replicator is called. You don't know you much about replicating, your mouth, though, PC. do you? <laughs> no, I duplicated it. But it's like, like the replicator. You native open it up tribes women food. that haven't discovered the like, advent of clothing yet that I can go and, like, frequent. Talk, talk to? You know, ex expand the, uh, the, you know, repopulate the earth with them or whatever else. We don't need any more Garys. It'd be hard to repopulate the Earth when you're <laughs> you're on an island. On the tree, man. <laughs> well, that's it. If I did, if I've got that as well, then I don't need games either. If I've got like, is this island exclusively populated by like sort of large thighed ladies that can kind of wander the hillside, or what, what, how's this? Oh man, it's just you. You're making this fucking amazing, yeah, genie. It's, I know this island's it's sounding genie. fantastic. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. My wife, she's watching us. Now, there doesn't need to be any women there. It doesn't. So there's no. Oh man, this is such a sausage fest. This island. I would have made this question so much better. <laughs> Wait, one sausage on the fucking island. Exactly. One too many. Jesus. All right. Your assignment, <laughs> Gary, is to design a better, better island for next week's show. <laughs> yeah. No more hypothetical questions for Gary, man. He's going to analyze the shit out of it. Yeah. <laughs> You ruined it, Gary. It's what day ruined. is the week? Is, is it a Wednesday? Is it a, is it a Friday? <laughs> <laughs> it's serious considerations. I mean, whenever someone tells me I'm on a desert island, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered before I consider what I'm... Why am I doing what you're telling me to do, man? You always question authority. I always he wonder if the there's a bunker on the I, I island, want... like if it's like an old Japanese bunker that you can like go in and explore. Or if it's like, you know, like uh, the one from Lost where it's got like the machine in it that you got to like yes. hit every 15 minutes or something. <laughs> Yeah. And black mist that comes through the woods. Yeah, yeah. it's all yeah. there. Or is it like cartoons where it's like the island? You could literally like take ten steps across it, and you're you're to the other side of the <laughs> island. You know, yeah. And there's like one coconut fucking tree, and that's it. <laughs> I'd want a big island like Lost so that I could go explore in between yeah. Chrono Real Trigger endings. Yeah. yeah. Real quick, guys, before we uh, leave, I wanted to go through a couple of the comments uh, here on Twitch. 
Inner Black Ninja says his three games will be Destiny, The Last of Us, and Breath of the Wild. Great, great choices. Uh, Ash Ratcliffe said Doom. I'm presuming the new Doom. That's a good single-player choice. It's It sure is. Soul Calibur 2, which I will beat you at, and Super Mario 64. Damn, that's a good... Doom's a good choice because not only new doom but old doom there's those wad files where's all yeah. the where's all the data files and yeah. people have revamped all the maps and stuff and like new campaign modes that's the scary thing though you yeah. don't know if he wants the new doom or the old with all the wad files the, yeah. extreme dan the, said the, the new doom has that like creator mode too right oh yeah, yeah. You can create, yeah. oh yeah and, and that and game is just the, fun like I, I, that game came out a long time ago now and I, I just keep jumping into it every once in a while it's just fun to play do you ever play the online, the multiplayer mode, bro? You should no. try it. It's really, it's really fun. I, I Extreme- have, I have like limited bandwidth for multiplayer modes, right? It's like when I, when I start doing something, I try and get as good as I'm gonna get at it. You know, and like obviously there's a cap to that, but I like to try and like focus on like a multiplayer experience at one time. Where single player, I can kind of play the field a little more. Gotcha. Uh, Extreme Dan's games were Destiny Two. Shadow of the Colossus, I love you, and Final Fantasy fourteen. Which Great version picks. of Shadow Colossus? The remake, the remake, or the remake? <laughs> I'm go the remake. I would one, go for the one three. that's coming out now. That's got, got to be the best one. Uh, I can't read this. The the Jagmaster X. His games were Fallout, Dark Souls, and Fantasy Star Online. Dark Souls isn't bad because you figure. That game will drive you insane, and then you'll hardly even realize you're on a desert island anymore. <laughs> Hermitage said uh, Destiny, Witcher 3, and a version of Worms for old time's sake. Witcher 3 is a good one. There's, these are all good choices. Yeah, Witcher 3 is like a Fallout type of world where it's just got so much to explore and to see. And Ash Radcliffe said, uh, to clarify, he was talking about the new Doom. Thank you guys for your uh, feedback in the comment section. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like to uh, give feedback for this show next week, uh, hit us up on Gmail. What is the address, Gary? RevolverGamesCast at gmail.com. Revolver I was asking Ga- Gary! Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Undermine. It's, it's, it's RevolverGamesCast at gmail.com. Perfect. Hey, <laughs> night. Uh we go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash Briar Rabbit. If you guys weren't able to see the live feed, check us out on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's YouTube channel. My YouTube channel, Beastly Gamer. And if you can't watch the video formats at all and you're at work or running the track, check us out in podcast form on Podbean. Did you say like running the track? Yes. Jesus, if you're man. running away from nuclear bombs that are no doubt on their way here presently, or if yeah. you're running away from white supremacists <laughs> in... Yes. In the south right now, you know, Check enjoy your run with a little bit of a right. podcast. You know, can we can we just <laughs> we don't want to be exclusionary in the audience. If you are part of the white supremacists as well, you can also you can listen. listen to us. You know, yes, now nah, so, nah, don't listen to us. I don't even want them as an audience. Okay, okay. fine. <laughs> well, the black guy says you guys can listen. Just don't say mean things to the black guy. Just only uh, make comments. <laughs> <laughs> Disabling comments. <laughs> Either way, we we, we 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 don't support you, but we will take your views. So yeah, don't support us. Hit um, that like button on that iTunes thing, by the way. Yeah, man, leave comments. Yeah, and and look, hell, Briar is what we're going for. Um, we didn't get a particular question of the week this week, but don't forget, you guys can ask questions. Just uh, title it "Question of the Week." Submit it at revolvergamescast at gmail dot com if you like it to be considered for the following week. I think Always I think the uh, the Desert Island one should be the question of the week. I do too. I think I think that should be the question of the week. Leave us your feedback nice. in Discord or the Gmail provided. Uh, let us know if you were trapped on a desert island, what three games you'd want. And in fact, I'd like to add to that question. If you get bored of the question as I did, can you change it to what would be your best desert island? Because I want to hear that. I want to know which islands I can go and visit. All right, that's a good question. Gilligan's Island is the only choice. All right, All right real <laughs> quick. Answer. Real quick. I mean, I've always had a cr- crush on uh, what was her name? The the farm girl. Marianne. Marianne, yeah. How did you forget her? I didn't forget Marianne's name. No, you Somebody didn't. No, you didn't. Happened. Or and she'll remember that. You know, she remembers. <laughs> so she doesn't you. care. She's always had an affinity for you anyway. 
I've got a request of all our viewers, actually. It's more of a gift. Uh, it's kind of an exchange of services. Uh -huh. If you could find it in your heart to hit the like button and the comment on anything that you find, be that YouTube, Podbean, iTunes, any of them, even if you don't, just like it and comment, be great. If you do that for us, then I will personally give you permission to think about me when you're all alone tonight in your bunk. Oh, you, shit. You have permission. You guys know up for that. everyone's going to hit the like button now. Thank you I'm so gonna... much, Gary. Does that include me? Because I'm going to actually like my own video. Yeah. We're never going to have more dislikes on this video than we do. <laughs> <laughs> should we Should we tell everyone where, where, where can everyone find you guys? Beasley? Did you already you do can, that part? You can find me on YouTube uh, at uh, youtube.com forward slash Beasley Gamer. And uh, – yeah, I'm making videos and, and enjoying my time here uh, streaming. I actually did a test stream. It didn't go too well last week, but I'm thinking that my next stream will go a lot better. I got a few more things figured out now. Yeah, we can work on that with you too, my man. Gary? Uh, you can find me on the island jerking it to seagulls fucking. That's pretty Behind much where I'm going to be. Behind or the tree. Or you can find me on Twitter at Gary Diaz underscore. Uh, Gary Diaz underscore. Then we find out if there's a Reddit for that. <laughs> How do you even follow that? R slash that? seagulls fucking. <laughs> there's there's two. There's seagulls fucking US and UK, depending on what your variety is. But I'm subscribed to both. I'm I'm not fussy. <laughs> that rule thirty four. If you think it exists, it exists. Rule thirty four, man. Yeah. There's a community for it. <laughs> Wilson, you can find me on Twitter at Ryu Wilson. That's R Y U Wilson. You can find me on Twitch. We've been starting up some more Twitch streams this week. I've actually been doing a good job of streaming like every other day. So you can find me there, Wilson309. What about you, Brian? Where can they find you? I wanted to mention that I have been watching your streams lately, and you started Warframe, and I've been really interested in watching Warframe. I was I was silently lurking because it was late last night, but it was, it was a good stream. I was enjoying learning about that game while you were playing it. I still felt your presence. <laughs> Like a judgmental uh, father in the wings, that was it. <laughs> I'm Briar Rabbit. You can find me on the Briar Rabbit channel on YouTube. You can find me streaming uh, 1 p.m. Eastern during the weekdays. I'll generally be on Twitch streaming. Uh, or you can find us um, you know, fucking anywhere. Just look up Fucking Briar anywhere. Rabbit. <laughs> just, just type Revolver Live into anything and you'll find us. And the skits that we do, we've actually been doing a lot more comedy skits. And if you follow the Revolver Live Twitch channel... Uh, maybe not this week because uh, I'm still setting it up, but I'll be doing some Revolver Live broadcasts throughout the week so you can come and join me through the fantastical world of PC gaming. I'll be doing some variety streaming there. And housekeeping note, if you've listened this long, it means you care and, and you love us. Um, you'll have to love this Motley Trio for the next two weeks because I'm actually coming to uh, get nuked with the rest of you in the US. Uh, I'm going to be in Florida for two weeks. But Wilson, so, Wilson has promised to do the next two shows with a British accent, so we're good there. Oi, Govna. <laughs> Oi, Govna. <laughs> you nailed it. So just like him. Cheerio, mate. Yeah, All right, guys. Uh... Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, Govna.